In this video, we're going to be analyzing how David Howell, one of the best uh, players in the world, is handling the Karo Khan defense. If anything about him, we can say that uh, he knows a thing or two about the Karo Khan and uh, he could easily switch careers and become a K-pop star any day of the week. So this guy is a legend and we're going to be doing a deep dive on what he does in order to get an edge with the black pieces. What makes this video interesting, I think, is the fact that he has played uh, the Karo Khan in thousands of games. And uh, I think we can say he's a little bit of a one-trick pony with this opening. And uh, the main advantage of uh, having a look on players like this is the fact that they clearly know what is the uh, main uh, opening theory. But at times, you're gonna see that uh, they deviate while going for moves that are, uh, let's say, not very common, but because they have uh, mastered this opening to uh, such level that um, they know these spots like super specifically and uh, they can afford giving uh, their opponents, let's say, uh, a little bit of an uh, opening advantage because they know that the positions are very tricky to play and uh, the white players are uh, very likely to go wrong and putting us in uh, promising situations. So in this video, we're going to be analyzing the following uh, main themes of the Karo Khan. In the first five games, we're going to see how to play against the exchange variation. Plus, we will have the pan of attack included uh, as well. So you get a quick guide against that uh, as well. In the second part of the video, we're going to analyze uh, five model games uh, against the classical variation after d4, knight e4, knight f6. We're going to see how uh, David Howell is handling the Tartak cover structure. In the third part of the video, we're going to have a look onto the advance, specifically the bishop to f5 move and uh, how David plays uh, against h4. He's got a very interesting uh, little pet line that he does. And uh, also, we're going to get to see what to do against the standard uh, knight f3 main lines. So with that being said, there is one uh, last variation that uh, needs an honorable mention, which is the two knights. And uh, we're going to wrap up the video with uh, three model games of David Howell against the two knights. As you may have already guessed, there is a lot of information into this video. So in order to navigate uh, easily, please feel free to use the timestamps from the description, go to the chapters that you need, uh, you can easily jump from game to game, um, line to line and uh, pick what you need and that's the year round uh, onto the video. So we're going to start the video by discussing about the exchange variation and specifically the way David plays this one because it does something quite interesting because after ed5, c takes on d5, now the uh, most common move in uh, professional play uh, it's bishop to d3 followed by knight c6 c3 with the idea that uh, uh, white is protecting the pawn and on the very next move their let's say positional threat is to play bishop to f4 and uh, get back into the london system while avoiding uh, a bunch of uh, annoying lines now if you are somewhere below 1500 uh, i think most likely you are going to face uh, some kind of uh, maybe even worse version of the exchange quite often, followed by uh, something like knight f3, knight c6, and then you're going to see bishop b5 uh, a lot of the times, which uh, I have actually covered uh, in the Karokan rating climb. If you haven't watched that um, already, definitely advise you to check it out because there I'm dealing with uh, all these kind of uh, noob lines that you don't really see in professional play. So uh, back to our game, uh, we're going to be starting with uh, Maurizi Mark Andrea, the, uh, let's say, uh, most recent, I believe still, uh, or at least the youngest uh, French uh, grandmaster, uh, which, uh, yeah, went for bishop 3 David Howell with the black pieces, and uh, went for the move c3. As I was saying, trying to get back into the uh, London system. But there we go. Here is going to be uh, one of the main starting positions uh, against the exchange. Because David really plays this uh, queen c7 line. It's really one of his pet lines. He does this uh, constantly. And I have to say, 
he does that in a very interesting fashion. I think highlighting one of the main ideas uh, whenever, uh, let's say, white plays an h3 kind of move, stopping bishop to g4, you will often see him uh, going for g6 followed by uh, bishop to f5, which is actually allowing white to uh, double up the pawns. That is one of the uh, main uh, David Howell uh, touch onto the Karo Khan in the exchange. Now, for the first game, we're going to have a look on uh, knight a3, which is not the most uh, common move uh, in the position by any means, but definitely quite uh, a trippy one. Because, for instance, if you go for the most common move in the position, which is knight f6, simply developing the knight, then uh, black is running into a lot of trouble after knight to b5. Hitting the queen, if you go queen to b6 or queen to d8, the main idea is that there will be bishop to f4. There is not an easy way to stop the move uh, knight to c7, and uh, white is close to winning. Which, uh, yeah, similar in case you go for queen to b8, trying to stop bishop to f4, whereas a very strong move, going for g3, preparing bishop to f4, and uh, once again, white has a big advantage. So in general, we're going to see that uh, this knight a3 is definitely quite a thematic idea in the exchange. You can see this from uh, time to time. And usually the easiest and most flexible way to deal with it is by simply going a6. a6 in the Karokan in general is a very nice uh, little uh, waiting uh, slash uh, useful move. So uh, here we see that uh, played by David. Knight goes to c2, knight f6, and now white plays the move h3, simply stopping the bishop from landing uh, onto the g4 square. And already I think this is uh, quite a tricky spot, especially for the more uh, unexperienced uh, players, because we don't have a uh, square for the light uh, red bishop, and I think a lot of... Uh, People would just go for the move e6, then maybe go bishop d6, castle, and say it is what it is. We'll have to play with a, with a bad bishop, which is definitely not really losing in itself. It's just a little bit inferior, but I think it could potentially diminish your Karo Khan returns uh, quite a lot in the long run. So instead, uh, against h3, it is better to just uh, do, I think, what uh, David Howell does and play the move g6. And you really want to be uh, careful with this because his idea is not to simply fianchetto and get castle, but he really wants to rush bishop to f5. And there is one important idea about the following structure. So knight f3, bishop to f5 is the idea, exchanging the uh, light squared bishops. And whenever white takes, I would say that uh, if you have this structure, Super important with the bishop on f8 and not on g7. I think uh, black has very easy game, at least equal, usually just uh, even slightly better. Because we have very simple ideas. e6, bishop d6, knight e4, rook g8, something like long castle. Black has very good control over the center and uh, just super active pieces. Now, the main reason why it's actually important not to rush with bishop to g7 is because let's say we think about a structure like this i think white is simply better now after bishop takes pawn takes since uh the bishop on g7 is like really misplaced okay why well mainly because of this block of pawns that is like really restricting uh, the diagonal i think white already has a pleasant choice between a number of moves uh, the computer really likes now the sophisticated 91, 93, and then bishop to f4. There is definitely any other move. I think white is still slightly better with the bishop to g7. So quite important when you are trying to reach this, uh, make sure that you still have the bishop to uh, f8. And also the way you should try to sort of memorize these ideas. You don't want to think about, all right, I can play g6 bishop to f5 in the Karo Khan and be okay. That would be a little bit too vague to, uh, in order so you can be able to remember it and it's simply not gonna work in most of the positions. So the way you want to structure information in your brain is kind of like uh, break the Karokan down in like three main chapters. So uh, say it's the exchange, the uh, Tartakover, um, or like let's say the classical variation, you can also name it that way. 
uh, then another one, let's say it's the uh, advanced, and maybe you can also have the two knights, even though for beginners, they don't really play two knights often, but you can sort of break the Karokan in these four like big chapters and uh, try to memorize uh, these ideas independently. So you can think of it all right. In the exchange Karo, I can play g6 and then bishop to f5 with a bishop on f8 and I can allow the double pawns. That is how you want to structure your information in order so you can be able to remember it and not by, oh, that's the Karo when I cannot develop the bishop actively, I just do g6 bishop to f5. You're going to get that in a lot of variations and uh, that's not going to be good. It only works in the exchange. So I think that's uh, already pretty clear by now. And uh, let's just uh, stick with the game. We see bishop to f5 and uh, white has um, many ways to, to play this. Um, in the game, white took, which is exactly what we are uh, going to be focusing on. In case they go for castle, which I think is what, uh, yeah, I think most of the stronger players do uh, nowadays. It's already like proven that uh, taking on f5, which I think most of the beginners will do, is inferior. And therefore, it's better for white to just uh, castle. You can definitely just exchange, play bishop g7, idea to castle, uh, go for something like rook c8, e6, b5, knight e4 ideas specifically against the knight on c2. And black has a very easy game. So, bishop takes on f5 was played instead in the game, and after pawn takes, castles, e6, once again, notice that David is not rushing with bishop g7, there's no reason to get that move in, but he goes a4, and now simply rook to g8. You don't need to be worried about the fact that your king is in the middle, even though uh, that's true, as black, normally we should try to get castled as soon as we can, because the situation is quite stable in the center, uh, white has no pawn breaks, our king is quite safe, and there's always like one move away from castling and reaching some kind of uh, level of safety. So black delays that for a bit, the bishop activates to uh, d6, we see b4 by white, kind of anticipating uh, long castle, saying that there's going to be b5 knocking at our door, and uh, white is going to get uh, some counterplay, but um, well, we don't really need to rush with that, uh, our king is quite uh, okay in the center for now, and David just goes for uh, knight e4, which is not only centralizing the knight. Definitely, I can say whenever you get uh, such a knight uh, protected by the pawns, I think um, you should never really lose in the Karo, or at least it's very rare. And uh, it's also hitting the c3 pawn. So white played the move uh, bishop to b2, simply uh, protecting the pawn. But um, after knight to e7, just a very nice maneuver, preparing knight g6, heading towards f4 from where it's going to be putting pressure together with the rook on that, uh, yeah, juicy g2 square. And black is already, I think, close to winning um, as early as move 15. We see rook to c1 played, and uh, after knight g6, uh, white played the move knight e3. Just to highlight uh, the fact that there is no way to stop knight f4 if you try something like g3. Black has a pretty easy solution, which, uh, by the way, you can try to find a video and uh, find it uh, by yourself uh, because there's quite a nice little sack that uh, we can go for and uh, win immediately by going bishop takes on g3. Main point being that if they take, take back with a queen. If you go to h1, knight f2 not only wins the queen, but it also happens to be a checkmate. So uh, keep checking your opponent. Sometimes it might be a checkmate, moral of the story. If king f1, uh, once again, uh, we find the checkmate on f2. So uh, that's not really a thing. White played the move knight e3 into the game. And what this does, uh, it's actually trying to get some kind of play. And I really, maybe you could try to post the video again, find what black played, because I think this is really a stunning move. And this is, by the way, a rapid game. So... They don't really have that much time to think. But still, the fact that David played this impressive prophylactic move really stands out to me. Because I think more or less anybody would have played the move knight f4. I mean, there should be knight h3 looming. Uh, any kind of sacrifices should be made. Computer likes this. This is top line. But from a practical perspective, what this does, it allows a mess after c4. Okay, sure, you could like maybe take on h3, maybe take on b4. But then there is cd5, the situation is potentially open up, opening up. In a classical game, sure, you have time to like calculate and refute this. But in a rapid game, 
from no play at all, white is getting, you know, a little bit of an annoying um, initiative. So David says, okay, let's not allow that and just plays the move b5, which is absolutely stunning. After this move, you're sure white is never going to get any kind of play. And knight of war is not really like running anywhere. We're going to be able to play knight of war next. And it's just that uh, now we won't have to worry about any uh, weird tricks. So white went uh, knight e2, simply knight f4. There is knight h3 looming. White right c4 anyways, but it's just like so much easier to refute now. Black simply took on h3, exploiting the pin along the g file and then collecting the f2 pawn. Everything is falling apart in White's camp, and uh, after Knight uh, takes on d2, the other Knight uh, occupied the central square, hitting the enemy queen, and uh, the game didn't last for long. After bc, everything is hanging, bishop b4, queen f4 looming, g4 was tried, but uh, after queen f4 and uh, queen f2 check, uh, White simply resigned because king d1, queen e1 uh, was going to be uh, a checkmate. So, quite an impressive uh, first game. I would say uh, definitely um, remember this little idea that we just seen with knight c6 and queen to c7, stopping the enemy bishop from uh, landing onto f4. And uh, in the following uh, games, we're going to see, okay, how to also deal with stuff like uh, knight e2 or all the other alternatives that uh, white has in uh, these positions. We're also going to see a structure where uh, black plays, uh, let's say, g6 bishop to f5. And... Uh, White goes uh, for a bit of an improved version than this knight 3 so stay tuned for that. In the following game, we're going to be having a look on uh, Aronian against uh, David Howell, played in uh, Gibraltar 2019. And what really uh, made me pick this game is uh, because I think it's something that maybe a lot of you could be wondering. After bishop d3, c3, and then queen to c7. White went for now uh, h3, so the main idea of this move is to avoid uh, knight f3, bishop g4, which all the lower rated players allow because black just has very easy play with uh, knight f6, bishop d6, and uh, short castle, followed by minority attack kind of ideas, and that's why they uh, play h3 first, and now black went g6, and Aronian played the move queen c2, basically saying that, all right. There is no bishop to f5 for you now. Let's see what you have in mind. And this is an interesting line. Quite a tricky idea, perhaps, if you see it for the first time. But to me, it looks like David was aware of it because he played uh, the best computer line. And this is a bit of an older game and still it's best computer line. So he definitely had quite some, uh, some deep prep there and played the move f6. Which is definitely something that you only play if you have uh, checked this position before the game. It's not really something that uh, you can come up uh, with during the game. I mean, maybe you can, but it's definitely very risky. So uh, if you are not sure about such moves, it's much better to just um, have like a practical approach. Go like knight of sex, get castle, maybe even play with a bad bishop. And uh, still, it's not going to be like such a disaster. Because if you play a move like f6 and it's not good... Chances are you can just get a losing position. But of course, David was uh, quite aware of this, I think. And like, he's just fine after this. But to me, it seems that uh, in the game, White really had uh, a hard time finding counterplay against this. So first of all, Aronian played knight e2. To me, it was clear that uh, knight f3 kind of scared him a little bit. This e5 push, e4 in the air, there's a fork. He didn't like this, so he went knight e2. We see e5, but still, e4 quite annoying. I mean, not really winning a piece because there is still b5 for the bishop, but definitely quite nice for black to get this center early on in the game. We see the move castle and then uh, knight g e7, potentially yeah, just developing, preparing bishop g7 castle and also while protecting against any potential nonsense with bishop takes on g6 while uh, covering d5 square as well. So... In this position, white went for de, fe, and according to the computer, there are many ways to just get a playable position. I mean, definitely not an enjoyable position as white, as black is just like so easy to play. Just think about it. We can the Ankero, castle, go bishop e6. We've got the pawn center. What else could you wish uh, more from the opening as black? Uh, I don't really know. But Levon goes for uh, for c4, which is, I don't know. 
maybe a blunder. Maybe he thought that he's going to be getting some interesting compensation. Maybe a little bit of both. Uh, I guess it was connected with a bit of a miscalculation, but uh, still... I think it's quite impressive to see how uh, David converts this after e4 with the extra piece. So he's winning the bishop. I mean, white clearly saw this in advance, but he thought that black will have a harder time castling and therefore there could be this kind of like sneaky 95 ideas. For instance, if you take, then CD is already a problem and uh, white is uh, already better. But this is, of course, not forced. And uh, David simply went for queen d6 and there is uh, just nothing working in uh, white's favor. Bishop f4 was played. If you move the queen, knight c7 wins, but there is once again bishop e5. And the whole game, it felt like uh, white was simply uh, sort of down a tempo in order to get what they wanted. And, uh, well, black's piece is just going to be converting uh, slowly. White tried uh, b4. In these situations, uh, you have to rely on these kind of like crazier ideas like before. Just trying to get a mess. I mean, you're going to get a losing game anyway, so... Maybe hope for some tricks. This is what Levon does, but the night before and simply night back, there's not really much that uh, White can play for. Queen Nixon c5 happened. Knight c3, Queen b4. Very nice um, idea right there. Very instructive. You are up a piece. What's the next step? Get rid of the queens. Okay. The only way White could potentially ever swindle this is by getting a weird attack against our king. In the end game, there's no such thing, and that's why it's the best decision. Of course, white needs to keep queens on the board. Trading will be similar to resignation, and uh, this simply allows black to castle while hitting the f4 knight. So there is knight d5, but uh, okay, besides defending, this just allows uh, another trade. And after queen a3, precise move, avoiding any uh, weird tricks. Uh, black is just completely winning. Rook e1 was played. Bishop to f5, covering the e4 pawn and trying to finish development. Rook to e3, hitting the queen, but after queen a5, queen to c4. And now the simple move, rook f7, actually quite funny that the computer goes for the cold-blooded rook ad8 here, not caring about like the discovery, but uh, okay, David goes for the human move, just rook f7, second uh, best engine line, and after knight f6, king g7, rook d5. You can try to perhaps pause the video, find the most practical way to uh, end this game, force resignation, because uh, we're going to have uh, some forced um, trades and uh, the end game is just hopeless for white. And uh, yeah, the move was indeed bishop to e6, catching these two pieces on the same diagonal because after rook a5, bishop c4, white is simply in a hopeless ending game. So not really uh, that much to be said about this game. Just wanted to show you how we can uh, potentially deal with this uh, little tricky idea queen c2 that may be throwing you off a little bit since there is no bishop to f5 but uh, you really want to remember this if you want to like play the f6 idea at all you have to remember it move by move okay there is no like let's play f6 on general knowledge or because i maybe saw an idea somewhere you have to be sure this is good okay just a bit of a kindly reminder right there. And yeah, f6 is very nice. e5, black is doing very well in this line. So, okay, with that being said, I think we can uh, move on to the next game. The following is a rapid game played between uh, Andrei Zigalko, uh, very experienced grandmaster with the white pieces against uh, David Howell. And uh, we see the exchange variation once again. The pet line of David Howell, queen c7, stopping bishop to f4, and then uh, the move h3. We see g6, and we basically saw in this position all like the uh, tricky lines, knight a3 idea, we saw queen c2 idea, but now it's time to have a look on, uh, okay, what is going on in this knight e2? This is very sort of topical nowadays, by the way, this is a super recent game played in 2021, and black still went for the move bishop to f5. Now, the small difference here is that bishop takes on uh, f5 is uh, still quite fine for black, I think, but more interesting for white in a way that they do get this uh, extra tempo by playing the move bishop to f4. That's the main idea behind uh, placing the knight on e2, so it covers the bishop. And after simply sidestep, queen d7, the game continues with uh, knight e2, uh, knight f6, and now knight to c1. 
pretty interesting maneuver getting the knight to d3 and this guy goes to f3 uh, this is quite nice i would say in general but uh, it is a bit time consuming and uh, black gets time to consolidate the game continued e6 knight f3 bishop d6 uh, inviting a bishop trade and fighting for the e5 square we see queen f3 and now the move h5 which is a very nice idea because usually white also has g4 uh, motives to sort of use the f5 pawn as a hook and uh, h5 uh, completely stops that clearly black is uh, gonna cast a long index game and uh, we see that uh, after the bishop trade long castle happens and uh, white goes for the move queen h4 hitting the f6 knight now i know maybe a lot of you are wondering okay why not 95 how do we deal with such an aggressive move i think that's quite a good question to ask yourself so taking is completely fine however even a bit nicer i think it's just to start with the uh queen c7 uh idea creating a little pin and after rook e1 now we can take in a bit of an improved version uh because well uh if rook takes on e5 there is a knight to d7 winning the exchange and uh after queen e5 we can simply trade them off and uh go rook dg8 already getting such end game is uh really nice for black just a slightly better position can double up rooks bring the king and uh we're gonna get like a similar situation in our actual game and black is pushing without really any risks so uh back into our game queen to h4 was played hitting the knight the knight activates and uh now white simply played uh, the move f3 of course we would be super happy if they take getting our pawn to e4 hitting the knight and then we could maybe support it with f5 so white played f3 trying to get rid of the annoying knight Knight goes back to d6, which is actually quite nice. The knight is uh, keeping an eye on a lot of squares, let's say. Um, controlling c4, um, controlling e4, just kind of controlling everything from this uh, central square. We see rook a g1, rook dg8, activating the rook, hitting the g2 pawn, rook to e2. And now I really like this uh, practical move by black, queen to d8. And I think the following is definitely a practical mistake because after queen takes on d8 i think uh, white is handing the initiative to black i think white at best will uh, be able to make a draw in this end game because it's just an equal position where black is pressing uh, because of the pressure along the g file and white can only sit tight defend or for a draw at best there's not really any active kind of play i think definitely a bit of a better approach after seeing the game could have been queen f4 and even though white doesn't really have such a creative plan, I think in general just trying to keep queens on the board is the uh, right call in these positions. So, queen takes on d8, we're very happy to see, leading to a nice uh, Karo Khan endgame. White went uh, h4, because a lot of the times a common idea for us is to play h4 and fix the weak pawn on g2, and we can double up on the open file and just attack it. Knight e7 was played, heading towards g6 g3 uh, is played by white because there is uh, f4 that's like quite annoying to deal with then you could potentially follow knight f5 and then the pawn on uh, h4 would be dropping so g3 is uh, kind of forced black simply activates the king and after uh, knight f1 we see a very nice positional sacrifice um, and once again this is not really connected with uh, some kind of like deep calculation I'm pretty sure David uh, did uh, look into this quite in depth, but uh, this is a move that you mainly play based on intuition. Because after the most likely knight takes on f4, pawn takes, and then knight f5, you are down a pawn, but we've got a target on h4. These two pawns are quite vulnerable, and our knight uh, became uh, substantially more active. We've got the open file. This should definitely give us uh, compensation at least for equality i mean if we get more even better so um quite a good practical decision i think king uh, now activates to f6 white tries to bring the king over to defend but uh, okay now that there, there are no uh, obvious uh, entry squares um as you can see like white is doing a pretty decent job in uh, controlling all the squares uh, along the g file so usually controlling an open file is a pretty nice advantage but 
If your opponent, let's say, controls uh, all the square in his camp, uh, this is usually enough to kind of neutralize that. So, therefore, we need to uh, create a second weakness. So, what better way to do that uh, than playing on the queen side? And there is b5. Very nice move. Just uh, reminding uh, why that uh, we can go for the minority attack. We see a3 by uh, them. a5, simply threatening to push b4. Into to f2 before push right away we're never really afraid of c takes because the pawn on d4 drops plus there's also rook b8 uh, takes b4 ideas so that would be no uh, no good for uh, white rook to c2 got played in the game and uh, black slowly uh, got a very dangerous initiative uh, well the king is simply activating collecting a pawn and uh, this is perhaps the uh, biggest inaccuracy that happened in the game Rook takes uh, on e2 looks very natural and perhaps gave white some drawing chances. According to the computer, it would have been better to play rook a8 first. I'm not like really super sure why, but I don't really think this is one of those positions that are like really important to understand. No matter how you play it, I think white has still a pretty difficult uh, practical task ahead. We see rook e2, rook to c8. Hitting the pawn, the main idea is that you cannot really defend passively because that allows king g3 and uh, black wins another pawn and with that most likely the game. White needs to seek for activity and he does that with rook g7. You see f5, king to d3. I think maybe a bit better would have been uh, counter-attacking with rook g6 but king d3 is still not the losing mistake. But uh, the end game, even though the computer finds uh, a draw, I think it's still uh, clearly way easier to play as black. Now, h5 was the losing mistake because of king e1 and then uh, f2 was promoting. I guess both players were in a pretty severe time trouble since this is a rapid game and we're above move 40. Computer finds this uh, rook f6 as only move to draw and I looked at this a bit. I think e5 is what um, he would have maybe played and white is somehow able to survive in this position because uh, after rook h3, that's threatening rook f3 and then get a queen there is rook takes on f2 and white is in time to uh, push the pawn bring the king and uh, we'll have to give up the rook for the pawn with a with a dead draw so white missed a chance to save the game in the end but uh, this doesn't really change my opinion that throughout the whole game black was very comfortable and uh, pushing this is the position where uh, he resigned like he's about to collect these pawns I'm going to give up the rook for the h pawn, and then we still have this two uh, pawns that we can later on promote. So, uh, quite a smooth game, I think, from uh, David. I think definitely highlight of this game is uh, the positional sacrifice uh, in this position, going f4, giving white the double pawns, and then getting a really nice and juicy knight, followed by uh, the principle of the two weaknesses, where we need to create pressure on the other side as well in order to make progress with this uh, b5 move so um, i think that's pretty much it about this game and uh, we can move on to the next game the following was played between uh, Toma Katarzyna and uh, david howell in the 4ncl uh, english championship and it featured the same uh, exchange variation but uh, the twist here is that uh, after queen c7 white went for let's say the most uh, standard reply by uh, going for 92 which is preparing uh, bishop to f4 and uh, yeah here the key idea in order to uh, make this queen c7 line work is to go for bishop to g4 the main point is that if white goes bishop to f4 uh, the best line would be to go simply queen takes forcing an equal end game after knight takes bishop d1 and then uh, e6 and black has a very easy equal game still i think you can definitely outplay your uh, opponent later on in the game and play it for a win if that's necessary but definitely very solid so this is not really a uh, very common move anymore after bishop to g4 and they will normally uh, rely on moves such as uh, f3 hitting the bishop and now what you want to remember is that uh, the appropriate square to go back usually will be d7 and the main reason is that uh, after bishop to f4 hitting our queen the point is to go e5 you may be wondering okay but what does this have to do with the fact that the bishop has to go into d7? Well, in case of, let's say, d takes on e5, 
knight takes on e5, if this bishop say was on h5, there could be a very annoying check on this diagonal if we wouldn't go back. So this is a very nice prophylactic move stopping any bishop to b5 check idea. That could be quite annoying. And in this position, we're hitting the bishop. Um, so normally, I think most common move for white is to keep. But after knight f6, castles bishop d6. King to h1 is uh, another common move. We can choose between castle short or long. I think castling long is interesting with ideas to play rook uh, e8, knight h5. And hit the bishop. e3 square is quite weak. This pawn on f3 is kind of soft. Uh, I um, definitely pick black here. I find it easier to play. And just uh, slightly better maybe even already. This didn't happen in the game, however, because uh, after e5, another move uh, that's uh, relatively popular, second most common move, bishop to g3. This is what uh, white played in the game. And uh, David continued with bishop to d6, developing the bishop on the natural square and breaking the pin. We see knight a3, and as we already discussed, whenever this is happening, rather than knight b5, simplest way to deal with it. Just play a6. White went uh, knight e2, and now we see knight g e7. There was nothing wrong with uh, knight f6 as well, but uh, David just preferred knight e7, keeping ideas of perhaps uh, jumping with knight f5, hitting the dark squared bishop. Queen to d2 was played, and now short castle. The computer is also uh, quite happy with long castle in this position. It's definitely something that uh, you could mess around with in these positions where uh, white has committed to f3. But um, David uh, decides to keep it simple. We see short castle by white and now uh, b5. I think it's quite a nice move uh, expanding and uh, perhaps setting up a little trap uh, now that I think about it. Because a4 is usually an idea, but I don't think it's quite uh, working here. Because after b takes, which is maybe a bit unexpected, you go rook takes, then the point is the bishop is on d7. And that would allow knight takes on d4, simply winning a pawn. So a4, b takes on e4, white will have problems to uh, regain this pawn, so that's why it's not a good idea. And uh, white simply went for the move king h1. Just uh, sort of a nice, uh, useful move, avoiding any tricks on this diagonal, perhaps. We see rook f8, just a nice little useful move. And then knight c8, which is uh, preparing to maneuver the knight, getting it to b6 and then to c4, which is quite a nice uh, square. We see uh, d takes on e5 played by white, knight takes on e5, and here I think we have the first inaccuracy of the game, because white played bishop takes on e5. Giving away one of the most um, important pieces, let's say, strategically speaking, without really being forced. I think if white plays knight e d4, there's definitely nothing wrong with uh, their position after knight b6, bishop f5, let's say, knight c4, queen c1. White has everything under control. I think the position is very solid and um, should be around equal. However, bishop takes on e5 was played, which we're definitely happy to see. After rook takes, knight g3, knight b6, white is, I mean, black is picking up the initiative. Rook e5, bishop takes on f4. Bishop uh, slides back and then uh, rook is occupying the open file. White cannot really challenge it since rook has to cover f4 pawn. Queen to f2 was played, bishop f8, a nice little prophylactical move, and after knight h5, queen to d8 was a bit of an inaccuracy, I think. The computer is super happy with knight to c4 in this position, and uh, I'm also quite a big fan of it, because the idea is to not take uh, with a b pawn. Because let's say, honestly, there is usually this rule that says you should try to take towards the center. Well, here it wouldn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, and I think it's just uh, clever to take with a deep one with the main idea that we're opening up this diagonal, which is potentially going to let us maneuver the bishop, which is going to be insanely active on b7. Whenever they play queen g3, let's say we just have to sidestep any weird knight f6 tricks. You can play knight b6 maybe, I mean queen b6 even, covering the 6th rank. And uh, black is just better with his bishops in an open position. However, David uh, played the slower queen d8 move. And we're actually about to see that he could have even lost this game in a pretty surprising fashion. Because after f5, he played the most natural move, knight c4. According to the computer, queen g5 was still holding equality. But he went for knight c4, which is actually losing. And I think this is a nice game illustrating that, you know, players like him are still uh, human, okay? They're insanely strong players, but 
they still make mistakes and think of it this is a classical game not a blitz one so knight to c4 maybe you can try to pause the video find the winning move by white because this was uh missed actually during the game and uh the game continued with simply knight f4 which was missing quite a juicy opportunity of um playing knight e6 and what this does it's hitting the queen just super annoying threat uh, the knights are looming uh, there kind of have to take and then the point is not to take that's just equal i think but to play f6 which is just a stunning move now if you go for pawn takes knight takes is simply leading to many ways to win simply as pick up the rook and then bishop drops why just wins material in case of let's say I tried making knight e5 work, but uh, apparently after simply f7, uh, knight takes, queen takes, king h8, white again has a million wins, but knight f6 is the cutest, you can already take it because of checkmate, and uh, knight f6 also happens to be threatening not only the rook, the bishop, but also checkmate on g8. This is just uh, ending the game. Definitely big chance uh, missed by white there. Play knight f4, and then uh, black is in the driver's seat for the rest of the game with the bishop there with a weak square on e3. I think it's really nice to see how David maneuvered around still. Uh, this position is already, I think, uh, objectively quite hopeless for white because uh, their pawn structure is quite weak and uh, the bishops are just way too active. The dash squares are a, little bit, are a little bit weak, especially this diagonal, as you're about to see. And uh, we're just going to have a look on how uh, David shuffled around. Queen e5, just imagine if we get another tempo, bishop d6, queen h2 is uh, knocking at your door. And the game continued like this. David does a great job in pushing on both sides, spinning the knight, uh, shuffling around. You know, there's no need to rush, make a luft. King h7, just slowly improving the position. Time to open up another flank of the board. Centralize your pieces. Get the rook onto the open file now infiltrate um, there is simply no way for white to stop both uh, entry squares of the rook and after bishop to c8 uh, simply threatening bishop takes on f5 white's position is uh, falling apart g4 doesn't work because it allows queen to h to checkmate and uh, queen to f4 um, simply leads to a losing position after the following move uh, white resign so maybe you can try to pause the video and uh, find the uh, little tactical shot that uh, ends this game and uh, the move was to actually just go for e3 working king and rook and the main point is that after queen e3 we don't go for uh, takes but we use a little magnet sacrifice they have to take and then uh, queen takes on e3 pick up the queen and uh, black is winning the game so uh, okay what's to remember from this game if they go uh, knight e2, remember to play bishop g4. So on bishop f4, you can go for uh, queen takes and just get a um, very sound endgame. If they play f3, remember to drop back on d7. With the idea that on bishop f4, there is e5 and uh, black is getting uh, very good uh, activity despite getting an isolated pawn in this uh, structure. Now, for the last game dedicated to the exchange variation, we're going to be having a quick look on uh, how David Howell is... Uh, neutralizing the pawn of attack definitely a very common guess uh, i would say in uh, especially tournament level kind of players so if you're like 17 1800 in that rating range you definitely see this on a regular basis i would say and uh, it's important to know how to play these type of positions and uh, especially understand how to play against the isolated queen spawn so we see knight f6, knight c3, e6, locking the bishop in, already quite an interesting uh, choice. Definitely there are many theoretical options in this position, like knight c6 followed by knight f3, bishop g4 is one of the like all the main lines. But uh, what I love about e6 is that it's definitely a solid move and uh, it's avoiding the kind of theoretical force draws that there are in the pan of. So if you look at the rating uh, range, uh, between these players, uh, David Howell has uh, 200 extra points um, and he's definitely playing this one for a win. Interested to get a solid possession, but not an immediate draw for sure. So knight f3 happens and now uh, he goes for the move bishop to b4, which is interesting. I think bishop e7 is playable as well. 
the idea with Bishop B4 is mainly to transpose into something um, that you could normally get from the Nimzo Indian defense after DC4. Notice that the trick here is, uh, and by the way, something that you need to avoid. I think most beginners, whenever they see C4, they take immediately, which is a mistake. Because they, they will get to take back in one go and uh, they win a tempo. So always the trick is to wait for the light squared bishop to move at least once, either to A2, either to D3. And then you take. So you force them lose a tempo. And yeah, with castle and now B6 is the most common move, the so-called uh, Carpo variation of the Nimzo. Usually bishop g5 is very common, followed by queen e2, and I've noticed bishop takes on c3 having quite a decent score in this position, even though there's nothing wrong with dropping back to e7. This is, uh, yeah, quite fine for black with ideas like uh, rook c8, queen c7, rook e8, and uh, yeah, black is just uh, very solid in this structure. However, in the game, instead of bishop d3, we see c takes on d5, which I think is the most common move for white. Knight takes on d5. Ed5 is playable as well, but you definitely want to get a more imbalanced game playing against the isolated pawn. Now, bishop to d2 defends the c3 knight. And after, ca after knight to c6, not castle, that was also fine. Uh, black starts with bishop to e7. Castling was uh, once again an option. We see a3, and uh, this is a pretty common position for the variation. Black goes for uh, bishop to f6. Activating the bishop and targeting the uh, weak pawn. White goes queen c2. Hitting uh, h7. And I really like the g6 move. Despite allowing bishop to h6. We can just play rook e8. And it's going to be very hard for these pieces now to do any damage to such solid uh, pawn structure. So uh, the game continues with rook ad1. Knight c e7 is a very nice and typical maneuver for this structure. Usually preparing either b6, bishop b7, or uh, usually bishop d7 to c6 to activate this bishop, rook to c8, and black is getting a very easy and kind of pleasant position against the isolated pawn. In the game, 94 happened, threatening to eliminate the fianchiel of bishop, which is definitely something that we have to watch out for as long as the enemy dark squared bishop is around, because this could potentially lead to an uh, unpleasant attack against our king. So, David keeps the bishop, rook e1, bishop d7, making room for the rook to activate, hitting the enemy queen, queen sidesteps, and uh, we see simply queen to c7, hinting towards uh, knight f4 ideas, and uh, in case of uh, rook c1, I guess we can simply play uh, queen back to b8, uh, having the same ideas in mind. Bishop to b1 gets played. Sidestepping knight f4, and uh, now we see this knight f5, which is another reason why knight e7 was played in the first place. This is a really juicy square, keeping uh, d4 uh, under control. Queen to d2 got played, queen b6. Now we see a little bit of a maneuvering game. Uh, by the way, constantly white has to watch out for bishop a4 now, which is a nice sort of little uh, detail why this is maybe a bit better than having the bishop on b7. Um, and then if they move away, the d4 pawn remains vulnerable. Still, we need to take uh, care of our queen placement first, but uh, now after queen b6, clearly bishop a4 is a huge threat. If the rook moves, then knight takes on d4, simply collects the pawn. Don't forget about the bishop from the corner that's attacking it. Um, white played the move g4, which is uh, just a sign of the fact that they have a difficult position. Computer still evaluates this as uh, close to equal for white, but I definitely think it's pretty hard to play. And uh, okay, a player like David who's very experienced is like really going to have a nice time playing around white's weaknesses. And as we're going to see, the following is quite uh, flawless uh, by black. We see bishop to h4. Bishop activates uh, using this uh, a4 square. Bishop to g3, intermediate move, hitting our queen, queen sidesteps, rook c1 and now rook cd8, quite an interesting move, not only move but definitely playable. Now uh, bishop goes to c6, trying to conquer the uh, long diagonal, knight e5 and uh, simply knight e7. Hitting d4, if you take this juicy bishop then knight takes and there's no way to defend d4 and white is simply losing, there is no attack. Here queen e2 was played. According to the computer, rook d1 is still somewhat equal, but definitely easier to play for black, I think. 
But after queen e2, definitely, well, I'm not super sure why rook takes on d4 was not played, but um, I guess the pawn is not really running anywhere, and David just played bishop to d5, just casually <laughs> improving his pieces, ignoring the free pawn. He went knight to c6 now, once again uh, hitting that, and uh, this time white took. We see bishop takes, and huge threat to win d4 now, so bishop e5 kind of the only move, but uh, now we see a very precise move by black. Queen to b3. Taking advantage of the weak squares from the enemy camp. Uh, let's say if you do something like uh, rook to d3, I mean, that definitely feels quite uh, fishy. So it's simply allow queen d5, and that is going to be quite a nasty checkmating threat. You play f3, bishop b5 picks up the exchange. And uh, in the game, bishop to d3 was played, trying to stop not only bishop f3 ideas, but also collecting the pawn. So... So this f6 followed, bishop went back, but simply rook d4, picking up the free pawn, black is ahead in material, and f5 simply opens up the bishop, uh, g5 was played, but after queen d5 and now the very precise queen f3, threatening uh, mate in one, you cannot really take the rook, because bishop takes on d4, actually queen h1 first too, just win, and uh, after the trade, Still, if you pick up the rook, there is bishop taking back, intermediate check, and then collecting the rook with a winning endgame. And I simply had to resign now because we could continue with king f7, double up, pressure on the bishop, two extra pawns, and um, just a winning game. So, remember this little idea against the pan of definitely don't take uh, on c4 immediately because that will allow uh, white to develop the bishop in one go. Make sure to wait until the bishop moves at least once, and uh, then you make your move, you take on c4. And uh, yeah, keep in mind this nice little regroupment that uh, black went for, to go bishop to f6, followed by uh, knight c e7, uh, the knight heading towards f5 in a later phase of the game, followed by bishop d7, rook c8, bishop c6, and uh, black has uh, yeah very smooth... Um, development uh, around uh, why it's uh, isolated pawn. So um, yeah, I think with that being said, I think we can move on to the uh, second part of the video, the Tartak over structure. For the second part of the video, we're gonna be dealing with the classical variation uh, whenever white either plays uh, knight c3 or knight e2. Usually ends up uh, being the same thing after uh, black goes for the move d takes uh, on e4. White will uh, usually just recapture, and in this position, uh, black has, let's say, two big main moves. I mean, let's say, maybe actually, in fact, three, but the carpal variation is not really that popular anymore. So you could go bishop f5, knight to d7, or uh, knight to f6, which is actually uh, going to be my main uh, recommendation in uh, the uh, upcoming uh, course on just about that I'm working on, and... Also, what uh, David played uh, the most. So, uh, knight to f6, the so called uh, Tatakwar variation, white is normally gonna be taking. And uh, for let's say the first uh, couple of games, we're gonna be breaking down uh, five games of uh, this structure. First few of them, we're gonna see how uh, David is uh, destroying some lower rated uh, opponents and with that i mean uh, players that are around 2300 uh, so um, definitely lower rated than him but still pretty strong and uh, for the uh, later games uh, of this part we're gonna see how he's actually playing uh, this structure against some uh, super strong grandmasters so um for starters in this game white plays the move knight f3 which is uh, not known to be the uh, most uh, ambitious reply for white. Nowadays, it's very topical to play c3, followed by uh, bishop d3, queen c2, maybe develop the knight to e2, ideas to perhaps castle long. We're going to discuss about that uh, for sure. But for now, this is by far the main move that uh, you're going to see below 2000, in my opinion, according to the experience that I've got from the rating climb and playing this variation a lot. Black goes bishop d6, we get castled. Okay, first things first, you want to avoid making the common mistake that I think low-rated players do. Whenever they see this opportunity, they're just like, let me pin the f3 knight. Literally, they cannot even uh, 
uh, you know, like <laughs> control themselves. Okay, I'm just trying to make this uh, sort of funny point so that uh, you remember not to rush with uh, bishop g4 as soon as you can. Because this could result in uh, maybe your opponent playing bishop d3, you go bishop d6 and then they could give an annoying check. Uh, let's say if the bishop was on c8, you could still block with bishop e6. Now you'll have to lose a tempo or block with a queen, which is not ideal or step back with some slight inconvenience. Uh, okay, not like a huge mistake, but definitely common mistake that I see in my students games quite a lot. Uh, bishop to d6, just get castled and then we figure out what to do with the light square bishop. What goes bishop d3? Both sides castle, and I think you can really divide uh, this variation in like two main parts. Lines where they play with the light square bishop on e2, or lines where they play without that. So either d3 or c4, the gameplay remains kind of similar. So when the bishop is on e2, the trick is not to go for bishop g4 anymore, because that's like no longer a pin with the bishop there, but... When the bishop side on d3 or c4, bishop g4 is like super annoying for their knight. Uh, and that's what David played. Uh, when they go for like bishop e2, we usually just start with uh, rook e8, bring the knight uh, next to the king, and then bishop either develops to f5 or e6. Those are like fine squares. Set up the battery potentially with uh, typical uh, play for the Tartar cover. We see bishop g4 in the game. Rook to e8, occupying the open file uh, as soon as we can, setting up a little bit of a positional trap since rook to e1 looks tempting, but that is already kind of losing for white because of rook takes to e1, forcing only move to take with the queen because uh, the knight capture drops the queen. And now what this does, we have managed to deflect the queen from defending the knight and we can ruin white's pawn structure, which is already, I think, kind of losing strategically. Can just like bring the knight around g6, uh, looming around these squares. The enemy king is just super vulnerable and they actually have an easy push. Uh, instead of this, h3 got played in the game. And uh, if you think about uh, h3, okay, we need to make a decision now. Do we always play bishop h5? Do we sometimes take? I mean, can we come up with any sort of rule in the Tartak over? You may be wondering. So, I think I've got some good news for you, and that is, uh, the following thing is quite simple to remember. And whenever you're playing the Tartak over, basically, and uh, your opponent goes h3, we kind of always go bishop to h5. Like, there is not a single case when we would take. Only the exceptional case when we take on f3 is if somehow white is forced to take back with a pawn and we just get the structure and we're just like strategically winning. Besides that, we always keep the pin. So that should be like pretty easy to remember. Bishop steps back and uh, after bishop c2, knight a6. This is a bit of a David touch, I would say. Knight e7, knight f8 is what I would personally normally do, which I think is definitely reasonable. But I noticed... Uh, Quite often, David likes to do this maneuver, sometimes jumping with the knight on b4 if allowed, obviously not here, but he takes this route c7, e6 for his knight. You could definitely do like a knight e7, f8, and then e6 uh, in like, it's not even like losing time. It's still like the same uh, amount of temp is required to get a knight there. But I noticed he usually does that. And I think it's uh, quite interesting. White went queen d3 here. Hitting uh, the h7 pawn, and we just need to defend. He does that by uh, using the bishop. Queen goes back, and uh, knight to c7. See, bishop takes on g6, already giving us the famous pawn cube. And uh, if you're, uh, yeah, kind of, uh, let's say, uh, loyal subscriber, you already know that the pawn cube is a win by force for black. That is a little bit exaggerated, but uh, still very nice. Uh, we see knight e2, and David goes for knight e6, just uh, doing his uh, usual plan. Um, knight to c4 gets played, hearing the bishop, and really important, we do want to keep that bishop, and we do so by playing bishop to c7. 
I think some people may be tempted to play bishop b8 just because they are like uh, really fanatics of this queen c7 battery kind of thing, which is definitely very powerful. But I wouldn't trap the rook into the corner. So uh, it's just better to play bishop c7. And next we could get rid of the knight and then play queen d6, still get the battery without trapping the rook. That's the main reason. Queen b3 got played. I think b5 is an option now, but okay, this was like a blitz game, so um, it's not like really the most precise game, but it's definitely still a very solid game and instructive. So, queen d7 was played, setting up a little trick. Cannot pick up the b7 pawn because of the discovery. Waving the queen because of the check. White went bishop d2, and now b5. David spots this idea uh, in the uh, second given chance. The knight is activating via f4, already creating nightmares for the enemy king. Rook e1 got played, and now rook e4. Very interesting practical move. Again, keep in mind this is a blitz game. And I know what everyone may be wondering. Dude, knight h3 is so tempting, it must be leading to a win. Now, this is what I thought in the first place too. I'll give you that. But, let's see, let's see if we go for that, okay? Queen takes, threatening mate, like, here if they do nothing, we just go uh, bishop h2, forcing this kind of standard mate in 3. Okay, that's like very uh, easy, just puzzle rush kind of thing. Um, very easy and basic pattern that you need for the checkmating technique. But the trickier part is when, okay, what if they play knight f1? Where is the mate? Imagine that you actually need to see the win, uh, like, uh, from a position like uh, three moves ago. And after the queen before king h1, it turns out that the only move is rook e4. Now, you may be wondering, why is this the only move? Well, it's not really obvious to me. So, when something like that is not super obvious, I wouldn't really bother with it that much. <laughs> so, uh, sure, it threatens queen f3, rook g4, but they can take, we take with a queen, king g1, and then somehow rook e8, I remember the engine like, they couldn't really justify it uh, quickly, and then I thought, okay, it's just a bit of a weird position, no need to like spend a lot of time here. And I, I'm, I really like what David played. So, he actually used a similar idea, but uh, played rook e4 now. And this is way more effective, and as you're gonna see in the game, it just worked uh, quite flawlessly. His opponent played knight c2. White's, of course, happy to trade, but guess what? This is simply losing because of uh, the same motive. Knight takes on h3. See, pawn takes. Uh, well, actually, we see king f1, but in case of pawn takes, that was simply winning for us. There is no way for them to escape uh, either rook g4, either the deadly mechanism. Bishop h2. Boom, just force mate. Okay, you can literally pre-move this one. They've got uh, nothing else to do. So instead, the game lasted for a few more moves. Queen f5, threatening mate on f2. Um, you cannot take the knight because of like the same pattern. And after f3, rook takes queen d3, rook e2. Okay, here, please be my guest. Pause the video. Try to find the winning move for black because it's such a classy finish. I mean, not the only winning move by any means, but uh, really a move that usually makes my day while seeing, so um, pause here for a few minutes, um, and then, yeah, the solution is to actually put pressure on the rook, and we don't do that by playing rook it. I mean, if you consider that, that's reasonable, okay, I'll give you like um, half of the point, but the full point was for knight g1, hitting a rook, if you take the knight, Pick it up, win the exchange, there's no way for white to defend. In fact, it just resigned in the game. So, that's the first little game of the Tartagovar structure. Uh, we just kind of solidify what we already knew. The fact that the pawn cube is winning by force. And uh, remember this idea that instead of knight e7 f8, which is super standard, you could also mess around with the knight coming towards uh, e6. With like similar ideas, so... Okay, with that being said, I think we can just move on to the following Tartakor game. In the following game, uh, David Howell is uh, facing a 2200 opponent, which uh, goes for an interesting opening, allowing the Tartakovar static position right there and plays the kind of precise c3. 
But after bishop to d6, bishop d3 castles. By the way, we're going to see that uh, David also went for a bit of a sideline. That is actually quite interesting. I mean, we're going to get to that in the uh, next uh, couple of games. Instead of castling, there's a plan in uh, which black could potentially go for a long castle. That's not like super new, but it was used by Artemiev in the past. I think it's not very well known though, so you really want to stay tuned uh, for that. But for now, we see the game going very standard and white goes for short castle. Usually people that play in this move order would go long castle from my experience, but this is fine too. We see queen c7, hitting uh, h2 pawn, and why just goes uh, knight to g3, knight d7, f4. Okay, f4 is not a good move. Why? Well, not super easy to explain. If I have to kind of guess why white came up with this move is mainly he wanted to play knight f5, but was dropping the h2 pawn. So therefore he came uh, up with this idea of playing f4 first. But I think as pointed out by David, um, well, not really the only move, but c5 works quite well. Because this diagonal is now quite weakened. Then we continue with knight f5. You see cd4. White took back with a pawn. Taking with a knight, I think, would already allow moves such as... Maybe knight c5, that's what, what I would play, and knight b5 does not look so scary since queen b6, and we have plenty of annoying discoveries. So, white took back with a pawn, trying to stop knight c5 from getting played, but simply knight f8, now just a very standard play. Also, uh, yeah, notice in this position, now that the queen is already on c7, there is no point in playing knight e6, and he has no nowhere to go, so that's why he played knight e7 this time. Queen c5, play knight f8, and king h1, okay. Now, what does that does is it's avoiding queen d4 with check, so if it were to take the pawn now, this loses the queen because the bishop takes on h7, and uh, that would be a little bit of a problem. Of course, bishop d7 gets played, and after bishop to d2, now this is sort of interfering this line and makes the fact that you can simply collect the pawn Doable. However, bishop c3, I feel like it would give white some compensation. Okay, not full compensation, but some compensation. And therefore, David just plays bishop c6. He is focusing on activity mainly. Bishop c3 gets played. Well, now, queen d5 is very strong. Putting pressure on g2. We see queen g4, but that is simply losing after rook e3. Hitting the d3 bishop. Bishop c2 get play, gets played, and uh, now this could be another little exercise for you. You can try to go ahead and pause the video. Think about the fact uh, that uh, we need to exploit the weakness of the g2 square somehow and try to come up with the best move. So, assuming you did take your time like a good student, the move is to just deflect the queen with h5. Forcing resignation, no square for the queen to keep uh, g2 protected. And yeah, the opponent just resigned. <laughs> can literally win against the 2200 in less than 20 moves without really doing anything that special. So there is still hope if you're out there hoping one day to get to 2000 online. That's definitely doable. Keep watching the video and uh, we're going to get there. Okay, so moving on with the following game. This time we've got a pretty experienced grandmaster with the white pieces, uh, Matthew Turner from the UK, and uh, he opens up with e4. We see knight to d2, and uh, after the introductory moves, we're back into the Tarta cover, and we see a somewhat tricky move order with bishop to c4. And this could perhaps go unnoticed to the less experienced eye, but this is connected with a bit of a tricky idea. I recommend we go for the typical bishop to d6. However, I believe Erwin Lamy mentions the move knight e6 in his course as an interesting uh, little trick to play maybe knight c7, bishop e6, neutralize that c4 bishop. That's definitely something interesting. But I think bishop d6 is more reliable and perhaps what uh, Christoph Seletsky gives in his uh, keep it simple course. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, definitely the move that I like. With the idea that on queen e2, we stick with uh, what David played which is the move bishop to e7. And I think 
If you really want to make uh, Queen E7 work, there is definitely quite an instinctive game that was recently played between uh, Levich Leon with the white pieces against uh, Ruslan Ponomaryov, and Black even ended up winning this endgame after Bishop E6, Bishop D3, which I think should be slightly better for White, but definitely an interesting position. For me, just for like a sort of a strategical um, understanding that I may or may not have, I mean, it's up to you to decide, I don't really like to enter this position. One of the main reasons is that I think just in general trading queens in the Tartak over, it's making it easier for white to play. So if we want to reach any end games, those end games should be like either rook end games. So let's say we get rid of uh, all the minor pieces from the board. Rook end games are always easy to draw. Queen end games. So imagine kings and queens with this same structure of pawns are just uh, fine. And yeah, whatever endgame, just say we take rooks off the board in this position, why has very unpleasant pressure. It's just like, okay, if you think about it, what's actually the real issue with the Tata Well, If you're not to this video, you may have already experienced that. If you just trade all the pieces, like it will normally happen in beginner games, you know, like you see something, you take it, da da da, you just do that and everything gets traded off. If we are a king endgame, well, maybe we should call it pawn endgame. Pawn endgame is just lost. Why? Well, you can see what has four pawns and we only have three. I know, it's not really rocket science, but this is what I have to explain in order to sound smart. So, the main issue is that we've got these four pawns here that are easily being stopped by this three guys. So we cannot really create a pass pawn on the uh, king side. I mean, we can with a little, with a little help from opponent, but... Let's assume normally you shouldn't be able to create a pass pawn, okay? I think we can both agree on that. And, well, for the following game, let's say you've got rooks off, okay? We're talking about this position with rooks off. Well, actually, we're talking about the king and pawn endgame. So, king and pawn endgame just lost, okay? We don't even have to talk about it. You just like white is playing with an extra pawn because of the four against three. Now, Think of the position only with the minor pieces. So say we get rooks off the board and to make it maybe easier to visualize, let me color this with orange. Yeah. Say we get rid of um, the red color pieces from the board. Still, the situation is quite similar to the king and pawn end game. We do have the extra pieces though, which gives us some hopes to survive, but at best we're gonna get a draw in that's gonna be like suffering all the time. Definitely you want to avoid this type of end games and really what you want to remember from a strategical point of view, the only end games that are okay for us are heavy pieces. Rooks or queens, those are fine. Minor pieces end games, really suffering. So when you're playing the Tartak where really your mindset should be trying to look for dynamics, trying to somehow compensate for this uh, little structural deficit that we have uh, by like either setting up the battery, um, and doing these kind of maybe sacrifices on the king side. For us, we always need to come up with dynamics. Uh, otherwise, we're just worse because that's, you know, the downside of having easy play but uh, double pawns. However, I think it's definitely worth it since it's not like really a king Zendian where you are lacking space and you need to come up with like intuitive sacrifices or um, need to spot some kind of genius tactic. Just not to resign, not to be winning, but to keep the game going. Here, usually when the tactic gets, you're just winning. So definitely a huge fan of this. And uh, I hope that makes a, bit, a little bit more sense why I think bishop e7 is better here. And why I like David's choice. When it was knight f3. And you're going to see that the bishop is not actually going to stay on e7 forever. Actually, we just get it back on d6. It was just kind of a polite way to decline the, the queen trade, okay? It's just like, you know, there's a girl comes at you, asks you for coffee. You're like, okay, sorry, I need to work. Or like, I got to need to analyze the Karokan, okay? I've got stuff to do. That's just so you can visualize what this bishop e7 move is, okay? We just like politely decline and then we're back to our business, bishop d6. Okay, white goes rook to e1. This is also another pretty clever move, and the main reason why this is a little bit annoying is that, well, the desired rook e8 would just hang a rook in a single move, so please don't do that. 
And yeah, we need to do something. What are the alternatives? Well, to be honest, bishop g4 really comes to mind now. Mm, I, I, I haven't really like even considered this in the analysis, which is kind of weird, but I guess there's a reason why bishop g4 wasn't played. Oh yeah, I think queen e4 looks a little bit annoying. Because if we go bishop to h5 now, knight h4, yeah, this is actually similar to what we're going to see in the game. This could be perhaps a little bit ugly. So uh, this is a bit of a tricky variation, by the way. Definitely, I think uh, if you are, uh, yeah, somehow getting into this position, they're not really going to have the subtle move orders and stuff. But if you're getting here, I think still, if you play bishop to g4, h3, bishop h5, um, they're not really going to be able to punish you for anything. Just do knight d7, queen c7, you get a normal game. You could do that. Um, I think that's definitely playable. But okay, these guys are uh, like what? best players in the world. I mean, at least how old David is. Turner Matthew. I mean, he's kind of old, so not anymore, but definitely very strong grandmaster. Uh, nothing against the old people. It's just that uh, he's not really playing chess that much anymore. Uh, and he just goes knight e6, which I think is actually very interesting. And from what I noticed, the main point here against bishop to c4, knight e6 specifically against this works quite well. Trying to go knight c7, and the main thing, we could go bishop to e6 and try to just shut down that bishop because it's quite annoying. So, let's say they go h3. This is, by the way, another game that uh, David Howell had against uh, with a black piece against Mickey Adams, English legend. He played a5, interesting move, and then just knight d5. Bishop e6 was fine too, but... Uh, this was also very solid for him. This is his game against uh, Michael Adams. It ended in a draw later on in the game. Uh, I mean, that's not really going to be covered in this video, but I guess you can Google it or maybe ask me and I'll post a link in the comment section. Uh, now, you may be wondering, okay, knight a6, knight a6, but what if they just take it? Isn't this just like terrible? I mean, how can we play with such pawns? That makes no sense. You're kind of right on that, but uh, it is not that simple because also you need to keep in mind the consideration that we don't get the two bishops for this. Just imagine if we could um, open up the position, the bishops are going to be insanely strong. Now, there is a game that recently played out like h3 and uh, bishop to e6 was, uh, was played. Now, you could definitely take the pawn on a6, but I think uh, Black's point was probably to follow it up with moves such as uh, either bishop d5 centralizing or queen to b6. And uh, if you enter this position, the bishops uh, do provide some compensation. Uh, here, the kind of uh, stockfish from chess.com that's like not really saying too much in depth is saying white is close to plus one. I bet if I give this position to Lila, it's like plus to 0, 3, something like that. I definitely believe Black has sort of an easy way to defend here. It's very typical to like Marshall, Gambit kind of compensation. Uh, but yeah, perhaps you don't really have to play bishop e6 even in this position. I don't think you have to sack the pawn like at all. Even you could play uh, a move such as a5 first and then do bishop e6. Like the pawn sack is not required. That's like the main point I'm trying to make. You can just do that and then set up the battery and you're fine. Bishop e6 was played in the game, though that we have. Um, and then after queen d7, black had a pretty solid position. Yeah, this is definitely a fine setup, but once again, you don't have to sack that point. To be honest, I think maybe black simply blundered that uh, in the game that we have, but um, yeah, we can't be sure. So knight a6, all right. We saw that. We saw h3. Now let's see what happened in the game. Knight h4. I think at this point still, the player with the white pieces has uh, this position quite uh, recently prepared. Because David Howell already had the game against Mickey Adams, and I think he really had that in mind while going for this game. Because knight h4 is not really the kind of move that you would play without having prep. Very tough to explain. It's not really something that I expect you to face, but um, I think it's just... Uh, a great example to see how David punished this. You went knight before. It's just a more active way of getting to d5. You could do knight c7 and d5. That's like exactly the same. He just prefers to take a bit more of an active route if possible. 
knight landed there and bishop takes on d5 was played. White is getting a uh, bit of a spoiler alert. Uh, sorry for that, guys. I hope that's not like uh, a problem, but uh, <laughs> yeah. actually wanted to ask. How do you evaluate this position? Okay, you can definitely see the eval bar, it's still close. So that's maybe even better because it's confusing you. But you could really let me know in the comments who do you think would be better in this structure. Black has an isolated pawn. That's true. But we do got the two bishops. So which one is better? Now, if you'd ask me, I think bishop takes on d5 is a... I think it's a pretty... Well, maybe not big, but... Not big mistake, but maybe we can say big inaccuracy. Is that a thing? Maybe it's better said if you just say mistake. I mean, bishop takes on d5 is definitely not what I would have done, at least. Because I kind of saw these positions when we do get the isolated pawn, but with a bishop, and I can tell you, it's definitely compensation. And what this pawn does, it's basically kind of canceling white's uh, majority. So with this pawn here, what I'm trying to say, these guys are going to be kind of stuck. And we do have the bishop pair, which is pretty nice. Queen to b5 happened and a6. Offering a little bait, you cannot capture d5 because of bishop takes on h2. And then we say, uh, thank you for the queen. Queen b3 gets played instead, and then b5. This is not really like top moves, by the way, this is a classical game played in the 4NCL division, I believe. Yes, 4NCL indeed. This is just like their kind of championship that they have in England. They play in teams and um, still a lot of strong players out there. Uh, G3. Bishop to e6, now that g3 gets played, bishop takes on h2 is no longer a tactic, so we need some protection. Bishop to e6, knight g2. Now, what knight g2 does, preparing knight f4. When the knight lands there, we have bishop takes, and that's just easy draw. Because of the opposite color bishop, just say you do rook c8, and you get that position. Okay, white is never really making progress here, their king is a bit weak, but it's also very hard for us to win. This is fine, but David really wants uh, to win this game, you know. He plays the move g5. Now, this, of course, comes with some pros and cons. However, I think the move long term is pretty good. In this game, maybe it's not like amazing, okay? I don't think it's like really the best. But I think long term, if you have the same sort of thinking process that he had to... Okay, let's restrict the knight from g2, and maybe we could play king g7, rook g8, and just push the pawns, try to mate the guy. Uh, especially you have to think about it in this structure, okay? You don't want to play g5 in any tartar cover that you get. You want to think of this structure after white uh, took, gave the bishop for the knight, and we got the pawn there, okay? That's really the uh, specific spot that we do this in. Otherwise, rarely we push g5 in the tartar cover, in fact. But here, yeah, I think his judgment was kind of good. Even though maybe not the most precise. And it's like super specific case. White went f4. Logical move. Trying to get some counter play. Because if you just do nothing, I'm telling you, h4, h5, h4 will come. And you could easily get mated. So white tries to do counter play. Bishop c7. Prophylactic move. Taking on a4. And now a5. Making sure that, okay, if the pawn is on a5, bishop covers it, it's going to be safe. We see queen c2 and then king h8. Now, what this does, okay, already going king g7, h5, h4 was kind of a bit too aggressive. So, after the white has played f4. So, king h8 um, gets played instead. Here, white makes a mistake. Because you want f5. f5 is shutting down uh, the king's side, which makes our king additionally more safe. Plus, it gives us a bit of a target. And the bishop is now more active. Main point is that, uh, well, after bishop d7, you can never really connect the pawns because it will, like, really weaken this diagonal. So, computer recommends rook f1, still after something like rook g8, h5, h4, like rook g7 if we need to be safe. I think black has very interesting play, especially when you need to play for a win. Position is roughly equal, but I like black. After f5, however, black is getting a slightly better position. White tries to trade off uh, one of the bishops, which is usually a good idea. Trading uh, your enemy's bishop pair. 
And we do get an endgame after queen a3, which is simply slightly better for black, okay? White can defend this with best play, but I mean, you have a really weak pawn and, why, and black doesn't. I mean, you can argue that d5 is a bit weak, but you're going to see that it's easier to protect. Plus, also, the fact that there is bishop against knight also is a bit of an edge for black here. We see bishop takes and bishop e4. Now, black is simply having an extra pawn. It's not the cleanest pawn of all time. And I think with uh, still precise play, white can defend this. We're going to see that, uh, okay, rook d8 just protecting the pawn. We're going to see that uh, white had indeed chance to survive here at some point. h5 threatening h4, fixing the pawns, and then it's easy win. So he finds a good uh, defensive move. Bishop to f5, threatening to simply take the knight, and that's going to be a winning uh, rook endgame. And h5 is really the mistake. Because king g7 and you just keep the uh, weak pawn now. Computer really finds uh, knight e3, hitting pawn, and then c4. The computer thinks this is enough to draw. I'm not like super sure why. You don't really need to bother yourself with. You're going to usually get gains where, let's say, you're dominating, but your opponent can get this kind of random activity and hold. You can't really explain that. Sometimes it happens. No need to, like, really worry with those things. But h5, definitely, um, you know, more of like a human move. Computers are defending. Usually human players are having a hard time drawing these type of situations, I can tell you from experience, so that's why you shouldn't really worry about it too much. King goes back, okay, just don't fall for the trick, don't take, because knight f6 takes on d5, winning two pawns. Uh, of course, if h6 check happens, simply king g6, and that's like uh, no counterplay for white. Now bishop e6, covering uh, d5. Still, c4, and white gets good activity. And in fact, uh, they can even make a draw after 96. Once again, it's not really clear why it's a draw, but uh, there is no way to win, apparently. <laughs> I've been a bit puzzled by this, so can't really explain it logically. However, white is not seeing that, goes rook a6, and then f4 is very precise. King f3, and uh, actually even bishop to b5 looks uh, as a move here which in fact got played, and that's why I think rook e6 was simply bad. Rook d6 now, ingenious idea. If we take, then white gets a lot of counterplay, simply draw now, because this pawn is annoying, this pawn is annoying, and uh, these pawns are a bit slow. But of course, there is rook e8, we can keep rooks. Knight has to move, and then we get to infiltrate. White tried sort of the last bullet with h6, but after knight e2, rook e2. Okay, there are many winning moves. F5 perhaps is one that I like, but rook e2 very tactical and strong too. You can't really go like... Um, I mean, you can play knight f1, but uh, there is going to be like same uh, f5, I believe. Let's check together. The computer likes apparently rook c2 and then... Uh, holy smokes, actually the knight is completely trapped. I didn't even see that. I thought we'd just play for f5, but this was uh, fine too. Uh, yeah, anyways... Every, everything wins in this position, so um, white tried rook b6, but after takes, he just liquidated into a winning king and pawn end game. Uh, white didn't take as of um, rook takes, and the two extra connected passers are easily winning, so um, yeah, that was a pretty complicated game against uh, English Grandmaster Matthew Turner in a pretty tricky line, so if you're a Tartak World player, Bishop c4 still is kind of uh, one of those things that definitely is a little bit annoying, especially if uh, you're not prepared. I would definitely uh, really um, advise you not to enter this endgame after queen e7. If you do, I mean, make sure you have it analyzed it really deeply and you know what you're doing. From my experience, this is just uh, playing with fire. Um, especially, you know, if the knight is on f3, maybe it's better, but with the knight on e2, it's like becomes very tricky to play. So I would just say stay away from the end game. Go back with the bishop e7, okay? We're busy, we've got stuff to do. Then go back to d6 and uh, get a normal Tartak over game. Um, 
think of knight d6, knight e7, bishop e6, while dealing with this uh, bishop to c4 kind of lines. And um, yeah, I think you should definitely get reasonable positions. And that being said, we can uh, move on to the next games. Remember that I said uh, there's actually a way for Black to maybe even try to implement uh, Long Castle himself in Tartak War. Well, in the next game, we're about to discuss, uh, yeah, about the, let's say, potential way we can uh, do such thing. So, this is another 4 NCL game uh, played between. Uh, it's Simons, I hope I'm not butchering that name, David against Howell David. So David against David. And we do get the Tartak over and the precise line with C3. Bishop D6, Bishop D3. We already covered uh, some games with uh, Short Castle by Black. But this time we see Bishop to E6. And you may be wondering, wait, this is getting a little weird. We're not like waiting for the pin, but we're also not castling. What is this? So I think this is mainly meant against lines that uh, white goes for, let's say, queen c2, and then they try to play bishop to e3, long castle. So this would normally actually play out like queen c2, knight e7, bishop e3, queen c7. And if long castle, then long castle. I think this is usually how this goes. But in this game, white goes 92, and this is usually a hint that they may want to short castle. And David plays queen c7, just trying to be a little bit annoying. In chess, it's pretty good to be annoying. So, um, you know, I'm pretty annoying in real life, and it took me pretty far with chess. So, uh, queen c7, what's the annoying part? If you castle, then h2 is no longer defended. We eat that immediately. So, in the game, bishop to e3 was played. And then, uh, 97 queen d2. This is like kind of a, um, let's say, a relatively well known position. There are like maybe 15 games with it in the database. Perhaps I shouldn't say like relatively well known when there are only 15 games, but there were games with this. Instead of bishop e3, also queen c2, I think it's common. And this is really the main point, point that I was trying to make. And uh, I definitely know a game where black played rook e8 between Duda and Artemiev. And Artemiev uh, ended up winning with c5 later on. And in the first place, like the computer has a really weird opinion about this. Things that white is just uh, better and it's like not even funny. But I actually played out the game a little bit between... Uh, Duda and Artemiev. By the way, now that we're here, I think I did already a little bit of research, but you can let me know in the comments whether you want to see Artemiev's Karo Khan sooner on the channel. It's definitely going to be here at some point. Just like kind of curious to see what you guys are interested in too. Because we're mainly making this video after my poll onto the Magnus Carlsen uh, video where I asked you whether you want to see David Howell or not. And many of you, for some reason, have a thing for David Owl, so here we go. Anyways, these positions are interesting. And even instead of rook 8, I think c5, which is a pretty rare move, works even better. Threatening to play c4 and then, like, maybe knight b6, knight d5. This is pretty tricky, okay? If you're somebody that's having issues with, uh, let's say, these positions while uh, getting opposite castlings in the caro. You could maybe introduce this into your repertoire and castle on the same time. I mean, on the same side. <laughs> um, and then uh, you avoid getting checkmated immediately. Maybe you're going to get mated later on, but it's not going to be that embarrassing because you're not going to be the first one in the playing for losing. So we can just lose and you're not going to be seen by as many people. Instead of this, however... Uh, white went bishop e3. We see knight d7, queen d2, and now knight b6. Knight b6 is a pretty clever move. The main reason is that uh, it's actually threatening knight c4, just winning the bishop pair. And that's just very good in itself. Why? Uh, it's not going to be like super obvious, but um, I think you already saw, like let's say, 
in the uh, Matthew Turner game, bishops were like kind of dominating the board. Bishops are pretty good, okay? I would say, in general, it's really good to understand things before you do them, but I think here is one of the exceptional cases where maybe you're still like in your early days of chess and you don't really understand the power of the two bishops. I would still really advise you to look for the bishop pairs, like really value that. Don't give it to your opponent, try to win it yourself, even though you don't know how to play it still. I think it's part of your chess development. Uh, now, for that reason, bishop to f4 was played. In case of knight f4, I think easiest is just to play bishop c4, exchanging bishops with a fine position. And we saw bishop f4 in the game. Black safely castled, white did the same, and now rook ad8. Usually the rooks are coming like this in the Tata cover, just rooks on the open files, very logical. Bishop trade takes to the queen, and we already have very nice activity. I mean, just think about the fact that in some positions we could even go c5. Not immediately, but at some point this d4 point could be quite weak. Okay, the knight still defends it, that's true, but... Uh... That's something to constantly have an eye on. You don't want to rush with it, though. We see queen f4, and I believe computer in this position thinks trading queens is uh, not that bad. However, if you've been paying attention and not, like, completely sleeping during this whole video, you already know that uh, we should try to play for dynamics and keep queens on the board. Okay? If you understand that from the video, I mean, I'm a happy man. You already... Uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna do much better in the Tatak world just by using that little idea. So queen d7 gets played. No matter how you keep the queens, you wanna keep them. Knight g3, knight to d5, activating with tempo, hitting the enemy queen. And okay, person that's been asking uh, how do we use the double f pawns in the Tatak world, I've been like getting these comments like spamming. I mean, like somebody's been like really spamming me with this on the channel. Here is your answer. David just played uh, f5. He heard you while saying it. Well, what is this f5 move really trying to do? I think it really is a um, pretty multi-purpose move. Mm. I think mainly what he did in the game is kind of telling. So uh, after Rukito, he just uh, played 97. Okay, by the way. First, f5, just not to get super sophisticated, is stopping the threat of queen takes on h7. Okay, let's be honest, that's like the main point of it. But also, I was thinking more of like a subtle idea of f5. But then, okay, I think what he did in the game is, uh, is your answer. Knight e7. Okay, this is normally something that's quite strange because it's a retreating move. So, when you have to retreat, or you're considering retreating for no reason, uh, that is usually a bad move, and you should not really spend a lot of time on retreating. Already, you're calculating a move like 97 in general, you're like, wait, this is retreating? Skip. Look for something else. Of course, David is, you know, much stronger player than you watching, and that I could ever try to aspire, and he can do these things. But it's not really as random here, and he has a point. He plays 97 for many reasons. He wants to either chase the queen or also open for c5 ideas, and there is pressure on the d5. But just keep this idea in mind, okay? It's super important. Because noticing a move like 97 beat being good ones, you don't want to think of you always want to retreat, okay? No, you don't, okay? Never retreat if you can. Only Frenchmen retreat. Russians never retreat, okay? You, you got that idea, I think. Now, hopefully. Um, rook e1, c5. Striking in the center, undermining. Okay, d4, not easy to protect at all. h3 gets played, cd4. White when queen takes on d4. Okay, I was about to ask you how do you think it's this move, but I think the double question mark is pretty self-explanatory and pretty big indicator and spoiler for me. So that is indeed a blunder. Uh, it would have been a bit better to take with a pawn, even though I still think uh, White would have had big initiative after something like knight g6. Queen g5 is like, let's say, the only square, and then the queen goes back home. 
but there is f4 followed by f3 and uh, we do get to touch the enemy king side making it pretty awkward for white so black is better okay queen takes on d4 why is this a blunder queen c6 got played you don't want to like trade because then you're going to have issues with f5 so if you do something like let's say uh, this that is, I believe, uh, bishop takes, and uh, yeah, if you take, there is takes, and you cannot really take back, and this is only equal. So you don't want to go for, like, the obvious thing, of course. But, queen c6, opening up rook's path. Now, of course, white is, like, 2370. He saw that in advance and played queen e5. Now, this is a pretty good question for you. Black to play and win. Maybe you can even go ahead, pause the video if you haven't seen this instantly and think of what would you play. There is definitely a pretty tempting move, which is rook takes on d3, just taking the free bishop. Do you think that's winning? Because that is actually the way to lose. I mean, not really lose immediately, but missing the advantage and getting a worse position. Because if you take, then there is knight h5. And now I'm asking you, how do we defend the g7 square? Only move would be f6, but that's dropping the bishop, and we just have a worse endgame. So, this is kind of the main point that White had. But, too bad he is losing in one move, I know. Always me, trying to be brilliant, but then losing into one move. Knight g6, story of my life. Queen b5 got played, trying to keep the bishop defended, but simply knight f4. Now we can take the rook uh, with check, intermediate move, but David, David is like, uh, yeah. He doesn't even care, as Hikaru would say. Just takes, and these pieces are not running anywhere, still trapped. The rest of the game is simple. Rook a2, because um, he's forcing rook trades anyways, like rook c2, there is bishop b3, rook c1, bishop d1, trading rooks, and uh, um, yeah, just having an easy conversion. So b4 played, and then the trade in c5, very strong move. Okay, now, I know maybe a lot of you would still have uh, issues uh, converting this. Well, you really want to sort of think either whether you can win these pawns. But, yeah, 94 is pretty annoying move if you think about it. Or whether you can trade these pawns, because... 3 against 3, let's say we trade bishops and we have 3 pawns against 3 pawns on the same side with rook against knight. Easy win, okay. Uh, I don't necessarily think um, if you're, let's say, below 1500 that you should really have a good technique on how to win that endgame. I think you can easily figure it out on your own during the game or even if you don't, your opponent won't really defend as well over the night. But just so you know, that's like an easy win, theoretically speaking, so... Trading pawns is fine here. David uses a little uses a little tactic trick. I mean tactical trick if you take there's rook d5 and uh, wins back the pawn immediately and that's GG. Bishop g4, however, gets played and then bishop c4, forcing resignation. Knight has to move and then rook picks up the b4 pawn, a pawn queens. We don't even need to discuss about this position. So, uh, before we move on to the last Tartagor game. What I want you to remember is that there's actually a line that not so many people play, and it's quite interesting. We can go bishop e6 and then, uh, yeah, do this little Artemiev trick. Play for uh, knight e7 and uh, long castle. That is not bad either, and it's really making harder for white to castle short. So, okay. With that being said, I think we can move on to the... Uh, I think perhaps the most interesting uh, Tartakover game that I prepared for you today. The following game took place in the Grand Suisse from uh, Douglas, uh, Isle of Man, 2019, between Daniel Evocaturo, 2620 uh, Grandmaster from Italy, and it is one of the craziest games that we're gonna see. I mean, it's up to you to decide. You let me know in the comments. So... We do get the Tartak over and we do get the sort of most ambitious setup. And we see David this time not going for bishop e6 long castle. That was kind of a one uh, time type of thing. So he does go for short castle. Queen c2 gets played. 
hitting this pawn. Rook e8 is always nice to give a check. This way, activating the rook. White blocks and... This is kind of a famous position uh, already, sort of the modern tabia. Black needs to solve the issue of the h7 pawn. Now, there is basically, I think, two decent moves and uh, a bad move. So, nowadays h5 is really the main line and what they normally play. I think that's interesting, however, if you're a beginner, maybe a little bit harder to play with such pawn. I mean, as we already seen, uh, this can be quite a useful pawn, especially with h4 and ideas that we're gonna get in this game. Uh, we also saw Ding Li Ren playing this way as black. Uh, I mean, if you missed that video, I highly advise you check out the uh, yeah the video where we analyze Ding Li Ren's Karo Khan. I think he's by far one of the most underrated Karo Khan players. Um, and yeah, this H5 definitely very interesting. However, if you're a beginner, I would perhaps uh, say not to neglect h6 in this position. Okay, to be honest, this discussion doesn't make a lot of sense if you're a beginner. Maybe if you're like, let's say, 2000. I would really consider h6. It's really underrated. It's not a bad move. I think it's co completely fine. I'm thinking to really recommend this in my upcoming course on chess. Well, I still haven't decided yet. I definitely analyzed this quite in depth already, and I know it's fine. Perhaps even maybe easier to play compared to the lines where the castle shard. Um... Okay, just my thoughts, just a uh, random I am on the internet. So maybe you don't even care about that. H5, okay, before we move, G6, not amazing. They're like castle long, go H4, H5, and this is just a hook. I think that's pretty obvious. So H5, castles. This is one option. You're also gonna get to see like bishop E3, long castle, and these positions. These are quite interesting to analyze and uh, have fun with. I think this is definitely fine uh, for black, bishop e6, b5, like these type of ideas, um, rook c8, definitely uh, playable. But uh, in the game, we do get to see short castle, which I think is generally the line that's a little bit more annoying because uh, it sometimes it could get uh, tricky when it comes to the dynamic play. Black goes h4 and uh, white simply plays h3. It's not really a move that they have to play, but normally the white players do, avoiding uh, black from advancing even further, I think. But as you will see, this move is actually sort of weakening the diagonal a bit. Uh, okay, Vocaturo Daniele, trust me, he's really well aware of this thing, but it's going to be an interesting uh, sort of battle to see how he's trying to handle it. Most of your opponents are going to get mated, that's for sure, if you enter these type of positions, but uh, I think it's very interesting to see his approach. Now, we get the thematic uh, knight coming to f8. Okay, as I was saying, like David has his own kind of mix, where he goes knight e6, knight c7. Um, as I was saying, it's mainly against bishop c4, so we can neutralize it. But 97, 98, still very standard. Oh, it goes c4. What that does, it's usually creating a square for the knight on c3 and just having ideas to advance. Uh, bishop to c7. Okay. This, I think, is not really a completely new idea to you if you're like, uh, let's say, um, if you've been before on the channel, I mean, if you are here for the first time uh, by a miracle, I mean, uh, well, Welcome to the channel first, and second, this is just preparing the battery. Imagine you could play two moves in a row. That would be a checkmate. Would be nice, I know. Unfortunately, chess doesn't work like that. That's why I'm still so low rated, but anyways, you're not here to listen to my complaints. Uh, Rook AD1, played by white. Centralizing, queen D6, threatening mate. Now, this is actually quite... Um, I think quite a bold decision because it could lead to a very complicated game, which by the way, white declines by playing the move knight f4. Now, knight f4 in these positions uh, could also be a blunder sometimes if white is not careful. Here it's not. Knight f4 is fine. 
main point is that, uh, well, we have to consider G5 and, you know, the knight cannot really move because uh, if it does, uh, oopsies, there will be a checkmate. So, uh, yeah, just watch out for G5 in these positions. However, the problem is that white can go for a vision. So, yes, I learned such words, so I can sound clever. That actually means intermediate move. It's just a fancy way to say it, okay? When they go for the intermediate move, it is queen d8. And after knight h5, well, we can very much resign. There's not like really that much we can say about this position. We do have no threats and their knight is in our backyard, just, you know, doing bad things. Let's just put it that way. So g5 problem is c5 and is disturbing our battery. And that's like why knight f4 is not losing. But before we see how uh, the game continued, I think it's fair to mention that, uh, well, bishop to f4 looked like an alternative, you know, just stopping the mate and uh, potentially trading the bishops. This cannot be such a bad uh, move, you may be wondering. Well, you're kind of right on that, surprisingly, but uh, the main thing that you want to consider whenever you see this dynamic with bishop on f4, knight e2 in the tartar cover, there is always a tactical shot with rook takes on e2. Now, more often than not, it just wins two pieces for the rook and you're completely winning. Trust me from experience. But this position is a little bit trickier than that. It actually requires an exchange sacrifice. So, well, if I just takes, that's like similar to the resignation made pretty soon. So they have to enter this uh, little forcing sequence. But after rook takes on c2, now they've got options. If bishop c7, rook b2, black is just up a pawn. And, uh, well, has a slight edge. Not very clear because the rook is not super easy to bring back into the game, but... Definitely fine, according to the computer. The trickier part is when they go bishop a3. Because now you realize, whoops, maybe the rook does not have many squares. What do we do when the rook has uh, not very many squares? Well, usually resign, but here we already have a piece for the rook, so not time to resign yet. But we need to find the best way to give up the rook. So we need to find the lesser evil, let's say. Now, rook takes on b2 is fine. In a way that you win a pawn at least. But there's something even better. Which is bishop to e6. Very clever move. Hitting the pawn and after you take, we take. Hitting this rook and now there's isolated pawn on d4. And I believe that all of a sudden it's not very easy for white to play this position. Let's say they do b3. Try to trade off our bishop rook d8. I mean, look at this position. We've got like a knight and a pawn. They've got a target. I think black has full compensation here. I don't really see a plan for white to try to play this one for a win. So I think this is maybe still sort of David's prep, maybe prep by both players. I'm not like super sure. I mean, what am I saying? These guys are machines. It's like move 15. I think they might be very well in prep. Might be wrong on that though. Um, okay. Bishop f4, rook e2. That was a thing leading to this kind of weird position. I think black was fine. You let me know in the comments what you think of it. Uh, now instead, knight f4 got played here. And, uh, well, we would once again love to play g5, but there is c5. And David comes up with a bit of a trickier idea. He plays bishop b8. Now, if you actually paid attention to the video a little bit earlier, I said, don't set up the battery when you trap the rook. Now, why is David arguing with me? Now, he makes me look like a total fool on my own channel. Well here as i was saying it's a little bit of a specific thing and this move is not really to set up the battery because it's already there i mean if that makes any sense but it's creating a direct threat david is playing for g5 so that on c5 he has queen c7 and then the knight still is under attack and we win a piece so that's the main uh, tactical trick behind it why simply play rook f1 why is like all right let's see g5 do you want to play it? Well, g5 wouldn't have been the best move. Simply because of c5 first, and then knight h5. And there are like some pretty wild complications. For instance, we can check and then there's rook e3, interesting move. You cannot take with the f pawn because queen takes on g2 is made. 
But after the king takes on e3, queen g2, and then bishop to f5, the king on e3 is somehow completely safe and white is winning. Don't ask me why. So g5 was no good there. You can trust me on that. David plays simply bishop d7. And now white goes for a prophylactic move, king f1. I really like what white is doing, okay? If, uh, let's say, I can definitely see this plan working out well and winning easily for white. This is a pretty tricky idea to deal with. However, I think black did a pretty decent job in getting counter play. Knight e6 got played, white checked, king e8, and now knight takes on e6, bishop takes. And here I think bishop to f5 was the sort of only inaccuracy. I mean, the first inaccuracy, let's say. Computer finds like some crazy ideas after d5. I did some research. I will just let the move that makes sense. I couldn't really understand here after like rook d4. That's like such a crazy good move. g5. Okay, that's like defending it. But then f4. Stopping the diag and, well, if you take it. Apparently queen f2 is winning somehow. Don't ask me why again. Let's not get into too much detail because it's getting super weird. Uh, it doesn't really make much sense. But d5 takes and rook d4 would have been a good find for white. Definitely not an easy move. Especially to find those queen f2. Just don't. White goes bishop to f5 and now uh, David is infiltrating. Queen h2. Bishop takes, rook takes and uh, well, already we do have a lot of compensation with that queen on h2. Only problem is really that uh, our rook is trapped. Like, take this rook, put it to e8, it's a winning position, I can tell you that for sure. White went d5, black took, and went rook e8. Rook to d4 got played. Very logical. Oops, hitting h4, and then uh, king g8. Uh, very kind of tricky prophylactical move here. And Vocaturo actually ends up biting the trap. He took on h4, which is the losing mistake. In fact, it would have been a bit better to play rook g4, and after bishop e5, now uh, rook h4 is fine, but still, black would have very good compensation with this, like, really annoying queen on h2. Positions around equal according to the computer, but I would definitely pick uh, black here. Okay, now rook takes on h4. Why is that the losing mistake? That may uh, sound a little bit uh, over-optimistic from me, I know. Um... Well, maybe this could be a good exercise for you if you want to yeah, go ahead and pause the video, try to find uh, the winning sequence. Because it starts with uh, queen h1 after king e2. The point is not to go queen g2 because you get, um, you know, you get to hand the initiative to white after queen h7. But keep the tempo up, rook e3. Now if they take with a king... The rook hangs with check, so they have to take... Uh, well, actually, that's what happened. And I'll tell you, like, the insane part about this. Why f takes was not good. Normally, this wins the queen. Not here. They could go king d1. But after the queen trade, at the end of the line, the sleeping bishop is awakening. Bishop g3, look at this. Look at this. The rooks are simply unable to defend each other. This is like one of the weirdest spots that I've ever seen. How are the rooks not able to defend each other, man? Like, those are like two brothers that haven't talked to each other in like years. This is really unplayable. Like, he's just winning. For this reason, Vocaturo probably missed it. And now he's just losing the game. King e3, okay. Black is up a piece, but still here, only one move wins the game. And that's bishop d6. Stopping both uh, queen c8 and, okay, there is still queen h7, but it's not going to be that deadly. There is this move. Um, there is queen h8, picking up the rook. White is up an exchange, technically, but the king is too weak. And uh, David, uh, yeah, never lets the game slip from this point. King e4 gets played. I mean, everything loses here. King e3, bishop c5, and that's like losing um, easily. Went to e4, there was queen c2, and then, uh, well, again, he could do many things, but everything is lost. And the game ended after rook d4, queen b2. Very nice final touch. 
Planning to win the rook while protecting b7 pawn. No kind of play. By the way, still, it wasn't too late to mess up the game. Notice David played queen c2. I was, you know, wondering, can't we just go queen a4? That's what I would consider doing. Picking up the free rook and being up a bishop. Well, no, because he yeah, has perpetual check. So this is still a draw. So definitely need to focus even at the end of the game when you have like many options like that. So, um, okay. I think with that being said, uh, we've gone over, I think, the most uh, interesting um, Tartakovar games that uh, David Howell played for the H5 now. And definitely keep in mind this... Uh, battery idea and uh yeah keep in mind g5 but don't rush with it when there is c5 use the clever method by david play bishop b8 and then g5 is constantly gonna worry your opponent and yeah hope you learned a thing or two about the um tartak over and uh with that being said uh we can move on to the advanced variation all right, so I already know that uh, probably this will be the most uh, interesting chapter for perhaps a lot of you since uh, from my experience, uh, most of the players really struggle the most against the advanced variation and for good reasons. Now, from what I've noticed in uh, David's uh, games, he normally goes for the move bishop to f5. And uh, in this video, we're going to be only discussing uh, about that and about his sort of pet, pet lines that uh, he likes using. Uh, okay, if you were to ask me, let's say if you find yourself uh, in a position where, uh, or let's say below 2000 uh, blitz rating on chess.com, I would definitely recommend you go for C5 here. Okay, for the sake of the video, since it's about David Howell and, uh, well, kind of probably figured it out by now. Um, we're going to look on bishop to f5. But I think c5 is going to be working uh, a bit better for you if you're, like, let's say, maybe not having that much experience with a Karo. Maybe just, like, picking it up. Way less theory. Your opponents are going to play way worse compared to how they would normally play against bishop f5. Since it's normally the move that they expect and... Uh, a lot of other reasons that uh, I explained in great depth uh, in my Karo Khan uh, rating climb, which you should definitely check out if you haven't already. Uh, there, I'm playing c5. In my first Karo rating climb, I'm also like explaining bishop f5, I'm playing only that, but in the second one, I'm uh, going for c5. You can watch both. Uh, yeah, pick the one that you feel suits yourself the best. Okay, now back to. Our story, David goes for bishop to f5 usually. And in the first game, we're going to see how he is dealing with uh, the tal variation, h4. And then in the upcoming two games, we're going to see how he plays against the knight f3 main lines. So uh, to kick things off in style, uh, we're going to start with uh, his, uh, let's say, uh, signature variation against the h4 move. He definitely plays this a lot of time. A lot of the times, like mainly in Blitz, that's true, but still I find it a very interesting uh, idea. And uh, I remember from uh, the white side while playing this line, I really used to hate the guys with the black pieces that were doing this. So, okay. In this game, his opponent is Starley Robert. Definitely much lower rated than him, but still the game remains uh, very instructive. And the move that we're talking about is C5. Which is super rare, okay, it's sideline, it's definitely David Howell's signature. Most people here either go h5, either go h6, or they blunder their bishop with e6. No matter who you are, I think c5 gives uh, interesting play for black. The line is uh, by uh, not by any means great or anything like that, it's quite dubious, but uh, definitely very fun and surprising. So, we see c5 and uh, white played the move g4. Now, the most common move, I think, for white is to go DC. And the game could go like 96. I'll actually just show you how his uh, game against Navara. So there's a gameplay between uh, David Navara and David Howell. That went 96, queen c7 hitting e5. And after b4, um, game went like this. a6, knight f5. Uh, white was up a pawn. Black definitely had uh, decent compensation and uh, eventually went on to win that first game. 
Um, so just to give you an idea what kind of positions you should be expecting. Um, this is basically similar to like a c5 line, let's say, if you were to play it here and then you somehow play knight c6, but the fact that there is h4 already committed, um, you get a juicy square on g4 for the bishop, which is what happened in this game by uh, David Navarra against David, Hallo David uh, Howell. Sorry. Uh, so, instead of that, we see g4 though, by white. And okay, the main thing you need to avoid, <laughs> definitely don't go onto this diagonal because that will lose your bishop. But, go back to d7. Now, White will normally go DC. If they don't, I mean, we can just go like uh, CD4 or Knight C6. And uh, we could play H5. Usually it's a thematic idea as well. We just get a very interesting line of the French with these pawns uh, overextended. We see DC5, Knight C6. Hitting E5, inviting uh, White to go Queen takes on D5, which didn't happen in the game because there will be Bishop takes on G4. And this position is definitely very interesting for Black threat to checkmate in one which is always nice pawn on e5 hanging there's like knight jumps uh e6 takes the pawn like knight could develop that way definitely position full of life here and good for black f4 got played in the game and now you really want to remember this idea h5 sacrificing a pawn just to weaken uh, white's position tremendously okay bishop to f5 now usually this is followed up by knight h6 but uh, this time queen d5 was a little bit annoying, so bishop to f5 first, uh, opening up queen's path towards d5, so protecting the pawn, and after bishop g2, that's attacking the pawn one more time, like just defense, see bishop e3, and now simply knight h6, already creating a pretty unpleasant threat of knight uh, to g4, therefore bishop f3 tries to stop that. We see now uh, pawn to f6, not only move, but interesting. David notices that there is no knight f3 move to protect e5, so then white doesn't have that many ways to protect there, and most likely he will take, which developed our queen, and now the b2 pawn is under attack. Black's development is speeding up, and after knight c3, black castled. We see knight b5, and now, uh, again, many pleasant moves for black, already big advantage, but queen b2, just the most human move. Picking up c2, and black already has a big advantage. Knight f5 was a pretty cool intermediate move, because rook c2, there's knight e3, and bishop f2, just bishop to e4. It was a yeah, pretty nice move, solidifying. I mean, black has finished development, he's just starting picking up pawns, while white is still doing nothing with his pieces on the king side. It's pretty funny. The game continued bishop e4 and knight h3, but after e3, black is completely winning. Took the c5 pawn now that the pawn on e3 is uh, blocking bishop's path. King continue with knight g5, but after bishop b4 and the pretty fat fork on g3, black is completely winning. King continue with knight d6, but after bishop b6, white resigned because uh, the knight is uh, getting trapped. So, pretty sweet and short game to warm up with, and uh, yeah, hopefully this gives you a bit of a fun idea to... Uh, analyze after h4. You could try out this uh, interesting uh, c5 move. We did mention that it's a little bit dubious, but it's uh, what David plays uh, most of the times in Blitz, and uh, it definitely gives that surprise element that makes the game interesting. So, this is kind of his thing against h4, and uh, with that being said, uh, we can move on to uh, see how he's um, handling uh, the main lines. Okay, so in order to see how uh, David uh, likes to deal with this, uh, more of like uh, principal lines in the advance, we're going to begin with uh, his game against uh, Kazimjanov uh, Rustam. Definitely very big uh, opening expert and strong grandmaster, which uh, went for the move 92, which is already yeah, a bit of a sideline, but still mainline territory. A sideline in a way that knight f3 is the most common move in the position, but uh, this is obviously very well known. White is just uh, playing with this knight b3 little idea, sort of uh, making it harder for black to play c5. You could still go c5 if you really want, and then uh, take, followed by queen a5. We already discussed about plenty of ways that uh, black can deal with this, even mentioned, I think, in the Vincent Keimer video that we did about the Karo Khan. Many interesting ways to deal with this. This is... Um, yeah, interesting, but you also want to 
be aware of the fact that uh, they can uh, throw in uh, bishop to b5 check as well, which can be annoying. I think in this position it was. Yeah, this is apparently like Lila's way of playing this and it could lead to some weird play. Um, so keep that in mind if you want to play this. Um, instead, um, yeah, usually black just is not no longer like rushing with the c5 move. We see knight d7 by uh, David, and after knight f3, knight e7, bishop to e2, h6. So avoiding uh, knight h4 ideas that there will be square for the bishop. And after castle, I noticed that uh, usually David has already implemented the setup quite a few times against very strong opponents in classical chess by uh, going for g5, which is definitely a very risky line. But um, I think... Objectively speaking, black should be able to get a fine game. Even though that may be a bit of a bold statement because like the games are just crazy from this position, okay? There are definitely a lot of ways that uh, you can play the Karo Khan in a solid fashion and just try to make a draw. And I mean, a more solid repertoire, I think, uh, we saw in the Vincent Keimer video where he's going for all the ultra-solid main lines. Uh, However, we see that David is definitely the kind of guy that's going for a fight. And when he's playing g5, he's not really like looking for to make a draw. He just wants an interesting game. Maybe lose, maybe win. Just get a game. This is interesting. I think we mentioned uh, this thing on the channel before. It's a line that I actually played myself quite a bit as well. It was super new, let's say like maybe five, six years ago in a way that there were almost no games with it, but since then the theory really developed and this uh, started becoming more and more mainstream and it's an interesting line. And definitely, uh, if you need to play for a win, I think it's a pretty good choice. So, um, okay, we're not only gonna talk about uh, all the opening details, uh, how to play move by move and uh, equalize, we're just gonna try to touch on some main ideas and. Uh, see how David's games went. This is definitely, if we have to talk about this position independently, it could literally take us like another four hours just to sort of mention everything. It's like a lot of theory from this position, okay? I'm not like the one recommending you to play like this. I'm just showing you uh, kind of the interesting meta, the top level and what they do. Uh, as I was saying, if you're like uh, less experienced, I definitely am a bigger fan of going c5 instead of bishop f5 against the advance but still this is very interesting okay don't get me wrong i mean if this is getting played between uh, two players of an average rating of 2000 i think black has an edge i definitely think that in these lines overall uh, black's uh, maneuvers are more uh, intuitive easier and straightforward i feel like uh, white's play needs to be very subtle quite cunning and deadly at times, but they need to be very subtle and understand all the little nuances, so not easy for white to play at all, okay? This is just, um, yeah, how the positions kind of work. Uh, we'll get to see that a bit later. So, white starts with uh, a4 here, just thematic move to gain space, bishop g7 and uh, queen to c7 now, just preparing either c5 breaks, either castling long, very useful move. Bishop to d2, and now uh, f6. So, nothing that I mentioned, but still quite a thematic idea. Hitting e5, we see... Basically, f6 gets played since... Whenever bishop d2 gets played, uh, bishop b4 to d6 could be a little bit annoying. You see f6, pawn takes, bishop takes. Uh, quite an interesting choice, because, uh, well, knight takes is clearly not so good, since it gives a uh, knight e5 to white. You want to avoid that at all costs. That's what we take with the bishop. And now 91, which is a thematic move. Okay, this is still like heavily analyzed. A lot of games with 91 before. I think maybe for white from like a theoretical perspective, 95 could be a smarter choice. And there are a bunch of games that uh, got to this position and plenty of draws. However, I feel like white's compensation in this position is kind of annoying. I'm going to be honest with you. Um... G4 is a move, G3 is a move, Lila recommends rookie one. Kind of hard to yeah, really play this as black, I would say. Even though it could be okay, it looks very risky to me. I think this was a pretty good chance for white, but 
Anyways, white went for 91. Uh, we see Long Castle, and from now on, I just feel like Black's position becomes easier to play overall, and uh, I think this is why, just in general, I think it's a bit easier to play as uh, as Black. If White knows this super well, I think they could usually get an edge, but um, generally, if, um, if you miss some kind of detail or subtlety, you can easily just give Black such an easy position, as we'll see in this game. Knight to d3 got played, king b8, very useful move, just, um, you know, like always play king b1, always play king b8. Rook a4 got played and give white two moves, knight c5, rook b4, and you resign, so we need to do something, and bishop takes on d3 is the right call. Whenever you feel like there's some kind of attacking ongoing, uh, exchanging pieces is um, going to be making your defensive task way easier, so that's what David does. See, pawn takes on d3, which is... Definitely very double-edged choice. Taking with a bishop would have been more natural, but after e5, it feels like black has an easy game. Uh, I mean, just an equal position, but um, I still kind of like uh, black more. Whenever a6 gets played, there's b6, so there's not that much to worry about, I feel like. Um, and, you know, we start pushing. That could uh, quite quickly become a mate. Open up the files, get the rooks involved. Yeah, there's no any like rocket science in this position to push these pawns. <laughs> However, in the game we saw CD3. And now knight f5 got played. Bishop to g4. And already it's time. We go h5. Taking is hardly ever a good idea. I mean, I haven't even checked this move, but I guess like either knight g7 or g4 are looking super juicy. Let's check together. Okay, knight g7, g4 are definitely some of the top moves, as you can see on the screen, I hope. But rook takes on h5, yeah, even stronger. I forgot that bishop covers h8, and uh, we win the queen, because uh, if the queen goes, there is mate, and we're going to have a uh, position with, um, let's say, he's going to get uh, two rooks, but we're going to have a queen and a minor piece, which is definitely putting us ahead. Um, so yeah, taking the pawn is not really an option. Bishop takes on f5, the right call. In this position for white, and uh, pawn captures a6, instantly b6. We don't play b5, because that's uh, giving away these important squares. So just b6, uh, avoiding uh, opening up the file and keeping the position closed and safe for our king. Rook to e1 got played, h4, queen f3, and now uh, f4, because the pawn was under attack. White went h3 after rook e8. Here it kind of feels like uh, white started to be a little bit too ambitious in my opinion. I think should have definitely played something like rook a1 and still it's pretty hard to believe that uh, black is gonna be ready to ever break through in good conditions. Yeah. yeah, I would as white definitely think of playing it safe. However, it's not easy to play it safe as white because if you Start trading, play rook e1, we trade rooks, then this pawn on a6 could easily become a weakness, so, uh, yeah, I mean, computer says it's easy quality for white, but as you can see, in the reality, the position is not that simple. So, in the game, rook c1 got played, and already black uh, gets a bit of an initiative after rook e6. a1, queen d6, rook c2, king a8, which is a pretty weird move. I know, but if you think about it, it actually makes sense because it gives uh, black an additional option to meet through kc1 with knight b8, safely covering the pawn, so you don't have to worry about it. And However, bishop c3 got played, and after rook e8, king h2 was a bit of a mistake. I, I mean, really, king h2, if anything, it just looks like improving white's position. However, uh, it's the losing mistake. I know chess is hard. Uh, Bishop to d8. Brilliant idea by David. Now, let's actually try to understand why bishop d8 is so brilliant. So, again, whenever you have a close position, okay, I think on this one we can both agree that it's uh, it's a pretty close situation since there's only like a pair of pawns that was traded and even in general, I would say, not only in close positions, but more so in close positions. You should always try to think in terms of pawn breaks, not in terms of like concrete moves. So, our pawn break ideally will be g4. 
how can we get that? So we play bishop d8, we get our knight to f6, we get rook g8, play g4, open it up, probably get a winning attack. And that's what he does. White tried rook a4, knight f6, bishop b4. Think the queen in one move, let's not blunder that. Queen d7, white went rook a1. Now, I think rook to g8 was also playable. Nothing wrong with it, but David just takes his time and uh, plays bishop to c7. Kind of a nice little idea. We're gonna see that maybe David, because of time trouble, was a bit hesitant of opening up the position. He made us kind of waiting moves, king b8. Still, like, he was always much better, but he could definitely, even in this position, uh, you could already play g4 as, even as a pawn sack with the idea that uh, there is knight h7 as an insane maneuver. Going to g5, queen has to go away, then f3, opening up bishop, and uh, uh, yeah, enemy king is just too vulnerable, while our king is completely safe. Really, the difference is in this position all comes down to king safety. As I was saying, instead king b8 was played, playing it slow, rook g1, but still there's no way for white to avoid g4 break. And uh, okay, I mean, not white, it's really he's in a desperate spot. There are no pawn breaks, no active prospects, not at all, like... White plays uh, knight a1. I mean, it looks like a silly move, okay? If I would see that this is played by a 2,000-rated player, I would say, okay, white is just the biggest passer. If you think about it with the white pieces, it's Kazin Jan of Rustam, who is, like, former world champion, and we cannot really say such things, but I think we can just agree that white's position is really bad, and when you have a bad position, it doesn't really matter. You could be, like, the best player in the world. It's just that the position is not helping. It doesn't matter. So... Knight the one gets played, white is simply in big trouble, they have no constructive plan like at all, and black is ready to break, using a little trick. Now hg, knight takes on g4, what's the point? You cannot really capture the knight, because if you do so, queen ends up on the same diagonal as our queen, and there is a little trick with rook e1. Checking the enemy king, and now we can check again, and collect the reward at the end, with a winning position, so... Why didn't uh, take and played b4 instead? Trying to go for some kind of play with b5 idea. Uh, next, if you let him, this could get messy. But, of course, David feels that uh, he should grab the momentum and just place the move h3. Pawn takes on h3 and then knight takes on f2. Goes for a very nice intuitive knight sack. Queen takes and then rook h6. Okay, now, this is completely winning for black. According to the computer, there are more than one way to win it. In fact, it almost looks like everything is winning since the knight on a1 is out of the game. But um, we're not really going to focus on how many other moves were winning and this kind of thing. I'll just let you know that uh, that was always winning. Never really messed up the advantage. Sure, he could have found like better wins, but uh, the result was always uh, there. Never really in doubt. And... Uh, Bishop d6 was a nice final touch here to uh, for the signation as there's no way to stop uh, rook h3 checkmate and that's a pretty sad uh, picture with the knight on a1. So uh, that was his game against uh, Rustam Kazinjano from the Grand Suisse. Definitely very important game in his career and uh, big respect for choosing such aggressive line with g5. And uh, in the next one we're going to see the same structure because... He's playing g5 uh, quite often, and uh, we're going to have a look on his game uh, played against uh, Jon Ludwig Hammer. Now, this game actually started with the same uh, little tricky uh, 92 move. Uh, well, not how most of the people reach that position with 9f3. Uh, but, okay, that's like not really that relevant. We're going to get to the main tabia soon after. Uh, okay. This is actually a nice, uh, interesting uh, little detail. So, this game was played uh, before the one that uh, we just seen against Kazim Janov. So, against Kazim Janov, he directly played g5. But this time he started with queen c7, which is a nice uh, sort of interesting idea that's maybe not really committing yet, trying to stay flexible. And Jon Ludwig Hammer went for bishop to d2, which is once again a pretty thematic, subtle idea, uh, preparing if you castle long, 
Okay, that is actually many moves for black in this position. David played g5, which I'm not sure it's actually the most precise one. It's an older game, so uh, yeah, we saw that he improved uh, on this line with his game against Kazim Jano, where he got a great opening. But yeah, after a4, I mean, g5 is good. And after a4, uh, this is actually, sorry, I just got confused for a second. I misread uh, the notes. Um, after a4, this is the position where he played the move bishop to g7, which I wasn't sure was the best, okay? Because what happened in the game was pretty unpleasant for me. Because after bishop b4, a5, bishop d6, he had to go back with a queen on d8. And then he just had to, you know, kind of live with this thorn in black's camp for a little while, which is giving me a bit of anxiety. So... Instead of this, I think perhaps uh, you could either go for... Even Long Castle is not as bad as I initially thought. Um, let's say when I was researching this position like five years ago, the feeling that I had was if white gets bishop a5 and then they provoke this move and then z5 coming, I mean, white is just winning. That was kind of the feeling that I had. But apparently after a5... This position is now kind of starting to get played, and it's not that clear. Lila thinks it's close to equal, and already games have proven that. Um, yeah, this is quite double-edged. I mean, white will try to open it up with c4, we play king b7, but still, we take there, and it's not that easy for white to make progress. Long story short. But besides that, I think perhaps strongest is just to play a5. This is like the most common move in the position, what Aliteza Firuzia played himself. Uh, by the way, if you're interested to see more in-depth how Ali Reza Firuzia plays the Karo Khan, we also have a separate video about uh, his games. Uh, yeah, definitely check that one out if you haven't. Um, it's not really going to include this line, but um, yeah, <laughs> doing one for the channel. So, 91 is like a thematic move and uh, typical idea in these positions whenever you see 91 or even in chess, I think this is a good tip. Whenever you see like a knight backwards maneuver like that, striking the center, it's usually the green light when you see 91. In case they take, we take back and it's like a pretty weird theoretical spot here. I think there are like a bunch of correspondence games in this position that go bishop g7 and all of them are kind of getting this position by force and um, all the games end in a draw. I mean, I think black should be fine with enough dynamics. It's a pretty weird line, however. Um, yeah. Not really gonna dive too much into detail. Let's just focus to the actual game now. So, bishop g7 got played. Bishop to b4. Getting this annoying turn on d6. But it seemed like David literally didn't care. Even better than Hikaru, I'm telling you. Now, in the game, bishop to d3 was, uh, I think, a pretty big inaccuracy by uh, white. Since then it was easy for black to deal with the bishop on d6. Now, according to the computer, rookie one would have been more annoying. Just a waiting move. Okay, saying, let's see how are you planning to get rid of the d6 bishop. I tried knight c8. But after bishop a3, still we cannot castle because that's like the main point of the bishop. Stopping f8 so we cannot castle. That's not a legal move. Okay, stop trying that. <laughs> and if we do this bishop f8, they still can play knight fd2. And even this position is suffering. Okay, maybe we can castle play f6, but our king is still slightly vulnerable. But not the end of the world. Now after bishop to d3, what can I say? Black simply took over the initiative. Knight f5, and now simply the bishop trade. This is just kind of what we've seen, but with additional tempo for black. Took with a knight, very nice move. Simply threatening something like g4 push. Knight goes to g6, and we can just push, go for the attack. White has no play. So Hammer found himself in a situation where he needs to do g4 just to kind of stop black's play a little bit, but... Not a huge fan of this since the knight is very close of uh, activating and getting to the f4 square. So things are starting to already smell quite fishy for white. The knight c5, queen c7 just defending the b7 pawn. Queen e3 and now uh, knight e g6. Simply heading towards uh, f4 and keeping this knight uh, to d7 just to trade the enemy annoying knight. Just in case it stayed there because it went back and black went knight d7. Having some f6 ideas as well. I mean, no need to rush with it, but uh, you can keep that in mind. c3 got played, rook to f8. 
Black is still keeping ideas to Long Castle and uh, we don't need to rush. We saw B4 and simply F5, even better than F6. Now, what this does, creating a huge threat of taking on G4, so more or less uh, forcing white to go pawn takes. Now we have to take with a rook because we need protection over E6. And after knight e5, takes rook f7, this is kind of the critical position of the game, where f4 was a bit of a mistake. It looks like the position opens up in white's favor because black's king is still caught in the middle, but um, yeah. once again, chess is a pretty hard game to explain sometimes. Now, computer is actually thinking that rook ab1 would have been uh, a bit better, and after knight f4, just h3. I mean... Place just like that. It's like doesn't make any sense. It's like knight takes on d3, queen e5, but that's like not so great, apparently. Um, yeah, anyways. Game went f4, very human move. Pawn takes, knight takes, but simply queen takes on e5. Now, I did a little bit of analysis here, and my conclusion was that even though this is a logical decision for white, it's simply losing a pawn, and David just uh, is exploiting that fact. So queen e5, knight takes. You could go uh, knight e6, but after simple uh, rook f1, uh, rook f1, king e7, very strong move, avoiding the fork. There's a threat of a, b, rook a4. Black is simply winning with opponent g4 losing as well. White tried rook a e1, okay, looking very dangerous. Yeah, all the pieces involved and the uh, pressure on the knight. Guess what? Simply knight takes on g4. If you do knight e6, that's like... Not really a problem. Rook f1 can sidestep the knight. Yeah. Okay. Let me actually quickly check this. I forgot to look at this. Yeah. Rook f1 as I was expecting. And then move the king. Many moves. f7 seems safer. Just have extra pawn. That's a big threat. And then a4 is loose. Uh, instead of this, in the game, h3 got played. And simply knight uh, to f6 if you go uh, rook takes uh, on e6 my intuition says king d7 yeah king d7 only winning move and then just knight e4 comes rook is under attack and uh, well once again the threat remains the same to go a b rook a4 among other things it's just lost for white uh, after knight e6 looking pretty scary i know until black plays knight e4 and white has no moves there is no fork because rook covers it, and um, yeah, we just have extra pawn, strongest knight of all time. White tried c4, undermining the knight, because if you take the knight, remains undefended, but you can simply go a, b, c, d, c, d, and the end game is won. However, there is still a very cool move that we're about to see, okay? After knight e4, pawn takes rook a1, protecting a4. Here, this is the coolest move that I've seen in a while, okay? Not the only winning idea, but... Uh, Definitely something that I, that I would be proud of playing myself. You can try to pause the video, maybe find it yourself. But um, it's a pretty counterintuitive move. Because black! Move 37! <laughs> Thought it was the right time to cast along. And it's pretty funny. If you look at it with a computer, it's best move. So David Owl is just a genius. Genius confirmed. See? Long cast. I mean, I would play that move even if it's losing. I don't care. It's just like the coolest move. But it's just a genius here. It's a genius move. Absolutely astonishing to me. Now, what that does, it's bringing the rook, threatening to infiltrate, supporting the pawns. It's very logical. Rook c1, rook c7, blocking the check. And I mean, white is simply down to pawns in the rook endgame. And uh, the rest is not really um, yeah, that interesting. The rook is simply too passive and there is no counterplay. Black simply pushed the pawn and, uh, well... It was going to be an easy win, pushing the pawn until h2, and then it's going to be a Zugzwang. Um, yeah, just to show you on the board, if you do nothing, this happens. If king c3, we promote. When rook takes, we get the queen. If you do it in a different way that uh, you play rook there, we're going to promote this one. Have to trade rooks and then get another queen. So the endgame was uh, completely lost. And uh, that's another uh, W for David in this... Uh, g5 uh, structure so again a bit of a risky double-edged approach but definitely it's a double-edged sword for uh, both sides as, uh, as you've seen in this uh, two games that uh, we have been looking at
Okay guys, so we're moving on to the final part of uh, this video, which is going to be dedicated to the two knights uh, variation by white. So uh, after e4, c6, going for the car, white now just develop, uh, develops both of the knights onto their uh, natural squares, which is mm, definitely, I think, a very playable line. If you ask me, I think uh, around, uh, yeah, let's say the top level, this is perhaps one of the uh, best, uh, objectively speaking, tries to get an edge uh, as white. Black obviously has uh, many ways of playing. I think in low rated games, they they don't really know how to play the two knights properly. And uh, normally I would recommend just to go like, uh, the e knight takes and knight f6 go back into the tarta cover and 80% uh, of your opponents are just going to transpose into like the classical variation that we have looked up earlier so that's why you don't really need to worry about the two knights um, uh, quite as much as against the other lines but there is definitely like a few uh, particularities of this opening that uh, it's kind of nice to know and in the first game, we're going to have a look on uh, the one played between uh, Lobel Cortel against David Howell. It's a rapid game. Uh, and David went for the for knight f6. Yeah, I'm just trying to get back into the Tarta cover. And, uh, well, this is definitely the most solid approach. Bishop to g4 is uh, also known to be as perfectly fine. Uh, the most popular move for a while already. Mm, Definitely something that you can do, but requires a bit of understanding of the upcoming uh, middle games because you're going to find uh, yourself a lot of the times in a position where you lose the bishop pair and you need to compensate for it with rather activity or uh, yeah, just staying ultra solid basically and playing more of like a defensive setup. Um, I never really played bishop g4 too much. I think it's fine. Definitely a lot of great Karo Khan players have used that a lot with great success. Personally, I think the e4 is like the move that suits me best and I had best results with. I also tried knight f6 a little bit. Did some research uh, recently. I was considering to maybe include this in my uh, upcoming uh, chessable course in the Karakam, but couldn't really come up with, uh, with a great line for black after, let's say, something like e5, knight e4. And knight e2, I just feel like... Uh, a lot of these lines are kind of suffering, so not great anymore. Even though knight f6 got popular, let's say, a couple of years ago. It was quite interesting uh, when I was making my rise in chess as a Fide Master, let's say, like five years ago. Knight f6 was getting uh, played at the top level, but uh, with now these resources, uh, supercomputers like Lila, I feel like it's definitely suffering. And, okay, Something else that uh, we're going to have a look on this video, something that David does specifically, and uh, I'm like actually quite happy about this finding because, uh, well, I looked this up a little bit on my own, and um, I think I even mentioned it in previous videos, even in the rating climb videos, about the Karo that uh, against the two knights, I think g6 is not a bad move. And the main reason why is, well, if they play d4, we can go bishop to g7 and we get a Gurgian Idze, which is something that we did a rating climb with as black on the channel. And if you haven't checked that one out yet, could be interesting as an alternative weapon against e4. And one of the main reasons why this is interesting to play the Gurgian Idze now is because the hardest counter for the Gurgian Idze, if you start, uh, let's say, with like the normal move order, this is how the Gurgenidze would play out. The biggest counter is when white goes for the Austrian attack. So after d5, they go e5, the bishop's a bit passive. Definitely interesting positions, playable, I think, easily below 2200. But, I mean, even above that, like Hans Niemann played this like a lot. Uh, so maybe that could be a topic of, of a future video, like how Hans Niemann plays the Gurgenidze. Or even uh, Hikaru Nakamura. So you guys let me in the comments if you'd be interested in something like that. Um... But okay, this is like the big, biggest counter, and when they play the two knights, basically with a knight on f3, we can transpose into the Gurgenidze since with the knight there, there is no longer f4 uh, kind of move. And this is kind of um, avoiding, let's say, the 
uh, most unpleasant response by White. This is what makes this weapon interesting, and it's something that David actually played uh, himself quite a bit. First game, we're going to see the E4 and uh, an interesting line uh, that he used. And then the last two games of this video are going to be dedicated to the uh, G6 mode. That is a very interesting idea against the two knights. So, uh, okay, for now, we're going to stick with uh, this one. And then after knight f6, most of your opponents, if you're like below 2000, are just going to take immediately. And after d4, boom, by magic, you have gotten transposition back into the classical variation and uh, you just save yourself uh, a lot of fury and uh, time analyzing other lines against uh, the two knights but if you're let's say um, somewhat higher rated people will start playing queen e2 against you which is the most ambitious move definitely really weird uh, if you come across this for the first time but it is quite annoying and there are definitely quite a few ways of playing this uh, well, well, its main point is that if you take on a, I mean, if you do nothing, they're going to take and you're forced to take back with the G pawn. They tried a lot of interesting ideas in this position. Okay, like bishop f5 was tried, uh, knight e4, queen d5 was tried, uh, knight e4, queen a5 was played, uh, even knight a6, I think, was played in this position. Uh, even, I mean, how Vincent Kaimo treats this, like knight e7, knight f6. We analyzed this in the video about Vincent Keimer. I think it's one of my favorite lines, objectively speaking, here. And also, an idea that I actually played myself once and lost in a pretty embarrassing fashion. But uh, it's because my opponent actually found a crazy over the board refutation. It was very weird. Which is the move bishop to e6. Uh, where does move possible? I know, uh, before you click away of the video, it actually has a point. If white takes on f6, what this does, it lets us retake and there is no longer a pin. Yeah, just to show this, maybe make it easier to understand. If you go here, knight f6, you cannot take back. See, it won't let me because of the pin. So there is three takes that's forced, which is a bit tricky and not really such a simple structure to understand and not necessarily great objectively as well. So bishop b6, point is, if they take, we take this way. Bishop d6, castle, easy game for black. Now, besides that, the most uh, natural move is d4, which happened in the game. And I was actually not lucky enough to get it in my own over-the-board game. That actually happened in my last uh, over-the-board tournament, like over, I think, a year and uh, a few months uh, ago. Uh, I played this variation as black. Uh, kind of as a surprise weapon and uh, my opponent really he was like an international master and he sat here for like maybe 10 15 minutes and was just like okay maybe let's play d3 <laughs> and that's like actually one of the most uh yeah annoying lines here uh i think um well i cannot really remember how this uh is supposed to go now yeah i've noticed queen c7 i think being played by um uh, Lawrence Trent against Greg Shahadi with knight bd7 idea and uh, yeah if g3 knight bd7 bishop f4 queen b6 I noticed was maybe interesting to play against us still a bit suffering uh, but uh, for the surprise value definitely worth playing I mean if you're playing this online uh, they react really poorly in general I remember having a massive score with us uh, in my online games now, okay, the main point is, if they play d4, this is what David had in his game. Now black is almost slightly better after knight e4, bishop d5. Main point being that uh, queen has to draw back, and then there's bishop takes on f3. And the biggest issue for white is that uh, queen takes on f3 loses a pawn. And this is actually what happened in the game, and you could just start uh, with an extra pawn. Uh, okay, besides this, g takes on f3 will be more common in your games, I think, and... Like he's just, um, I think, strategically clearly better with a messed up structure. There's actually a gameplay between uh, Nakamura and Fedosev, 2020 in Blitz. Uh, well, Black ended up winning. So, um, yeah, just could think of maybe even G6 sometimes to shut down the file if they go Rook G1 and uh, like 95 try to get a piece around F4. He could cast along even maybe 95 Queen F6 or Queen will go to C7, cast along, and um, Black should definitely be. Pushing without much counterplay. 
Now, in the game, White went for the pawn sack. Uh, by the way, with the white pieces, there's like a strong IM, so 2400 rated player. We see knight d7, bishop e3, and now queen to b4, which is, I think, a nice little detail. However, queen b2 was also not bad, with simple plan to just go back after the castle. And I think black is slightly better. Queen b4 was played, and then queen takes on b2. And I think even uh, taking c3 was not bad. But that's a little bit too greedy in general. So David goes for more like a more of like a human approach, just uh, by initiating trades where a move such as knight e5, uh, hitting both the queen and the bishop. We see the trade and then rook d8. So trying to um, catch up on development by um, introducing the rook uh, and attacking the enemy queen. Queen to b5, very nice uh, move, bringing back... Uh, the queen while uh, winning a tempo. White went queen h4. This is a bit of a risky move. I think for white it's time to just uh, kind of settle on uh, trying to equalize. Take on a7. Black is still up a pawn but after a4. I think white definitely has enough activity to regain the pawn and hold equality. However, this did not happen and uh, we saw queen h4 in the game. Now black is simply trying to catch up in development. White uh, took a pawn, but they're still down one, and uh, black is ready to castle. This is a nice little detail, because if you start with castling, which is very human, bishop d4 could be a little bit annoying, and we'll have to play something ugly like f6. So if you could just uh, improve the move order, why not? Bishop f6 was um, kind of nice. Rook b1, and now queen c4 was played. Pretty nice move. Sacrificing the pawn because queen a6, bishop c5, you're unable to castle and it can get a bit annoying. So in the game we saw queen c4, rook b7 and just castle. So the position is now completely even uh, from a material uh, perspective. However, white's got uh, two pawns that are vulnerable and it's true that maybe we're going to lose c6 in the uh, in the meantime, but... I think a scenario that, uh, okay, we win a2 and c3 for losing c6 and we keep 4 against 3 in the middle game. That's like a theoretical draw, but we definitely get to push that for a win. Maybe we win, maybe we don't. Definitely a nice position to be in. However, you're going to see that the game took a pretty abrupt turn. After rook b3, queen e2 was played. Hitting the pawn on a2 and... Uh, I play the move rook a3, which is just losing on the spot. I mean, you can maybe even try to pause the video and uh, find uh, black's continuation. Because after the following move, white simply resigned, which is rook d1. Forcing mate, you cannot really like fight with mate. So, white was supposed to make a luft, give up on the a2 pawn. Black is better, pushing for a win. But okay, this was a rapid game and um, white under pressure felt for the trap. But nevertheless, uh, showing that uh, you could do this trap at any level, like whoever plays queen e2 against you, go bishop e6. They won't really know how to react against this, unless you're me, the most, uh, the unluckiest person of all time that you play the line for the first time in your life, like not even an online game that I had with it in Titan Tuesday or anything. Opponent sets down for 20 minutes over the board, completely refutes your line and plays like all best lines. So um, I took that for the team, let's say, now for sure you're not going to get to face that. So really expecting you to face a lot of d4 and uh, you get this nice uh, bishop d5 uh, taking on f3. Surprising idea. So um, okay, with that uh, being said, I think we can uh, move on to the trickier setup when uh, black goes for the Yankero. The following is a game played between uh, Mork Arne and uh, David Howell. Played in the Norway uh, Championship, I think it is a team event, played in 2020, and uh, okay, definitely big rating gap, white player is 2250 against David Howell, who's basically a god, and went for g6. Now we see the move d4, and black goes for bishop to g7. And white now went for bishop to d3, which is definitely a pretty humble but uh, strong move. Okay, we need to talk a little bit about the theory of this. Definitely, I kind of explained this in greater depth in the rating line that I started with this opening on the channel, so you can check that one out if you are um, interested in more, like seeing how the game could develop and 
things like that. But I think for starters, important to mention that one of the most common moves that you're going to face if you're playing this line is e5. And after bishop to g4, getting the pin, we give up the bishop whenever they play h3 and play knight d7. Here even f6 is a pretty strong move undermining, but you could just play like the same e6, knight e7 all the time, try to play c5, knight e6, undermine these pawns, and usually black just gets a better position from the opening because they're going to drop their center pawns. It's just how it happens. And... In castle shot, obviously. That's what you're going to get to see in most of your games. You're going to get to see e5. Besides that, you're going to also get to see some kind of weird exchange. But don't be afraid to play knight c6. I mean, if they play knight e5, just bishop d7 and you have no worries. If they castle bishop g4 and just defend your pawn, castle next, rook c8, uh, a6, b5, play on the queen side. Typical play for the exchange, just focus on the minority attack. And besides that, what is actually considered to be the most uh, annoying move from a theoretical perspective in this position for a while, at least, was h3. And here you have two interesting options. So when, let's say, against what is supposed to be white's best move, you have two interesting options, that's usually a good sign. One of them is the e4 with a point to play knight f6 and after takes. Don't take with the bishop because bishop h6 will make it hard to castle. But with a pawn and we get actually a structure that's quite similar to the tartak board as you can see. So that is definitely something you could think of adding into your repertoire. But instead of this, what I like even better, uh, this knight f6 move, e5 and then knight e4. There's definitely more concrete knowledge besides that, but I can tell you, I think this is what Hans Niemann played uh, quite a bit. Um, I tested it already. I got like really a surprising amount of quick wins from this after especially 94. And even when they go for like what's considered to be the refutation, like 95 and all the aggressive stuff, even forgot how this goes. I believe it's either c5 in this position. I think it's c5, bishop c4, castle, they play c3. Um, yeah, even these positions, I think black has really good hidden potential. So, mm -hmm. yeah, you have these options against h3. Definitely, if you are a lower rated person, you're not going to face h3, but it's not really an issue. In case of bishop to d3, this is what happened in the game. Same idea, bishop g4. And after h3, we always uh, want to take and... Uh, Important to not really rush with taking such pawns. Yes, it looks pretty juicy, but after castle, there's ed5 ideas. Uh, you cannot like really finish development with knight f6, so that always let them play bishop h6, and white gets too good uh, compensation there. So just go de like David did, and pick up the d4 pawn with the queen. And the following was just a slightly better position by black. Um, the game continued like this. Just an extra pawn. I mean, knight e5 was played here, which I think it was a bit of an inaccuracy. Knight f6 seems better, and I sort of struggle to see white's compensation for the pawn in this position. But uh, the game got a little bit messy after David went knight e5. Uh, he was, like, kind of in the driver's seat forever. Uh, until he no longer was. Like, all this brilliant stories start. So after bishop e5, e6... White played this great h4 move, okay? If the white, uh, I mean, player with the white piece is watching the video, h4 was a great move. Just threatening to get some kind of play. You can't really push h5 because that's uh, weakening the king a little bit too much. For instance, bishop takes on e6 is already a mod f. If you take, that is queen takes on g6. You can play rook f7, but I'm telling you, this is just uh, starting to look very scary. The knight is out of the game. Uh, and the rook is coming over. This is looking like really scary. For this reason, white is getting some decent compensation. And David won knight b6. White played h5 and now rook a e8 was a pretty bad move. Okay, he was supposed to play thing knight c4. Uh, wait, actually knight c4 was uh, losing for the same uh, motive as uh, in the game. Like, this is uh, really deadly, hitting this, threatening h6, queen f4, white just wins on the spot. That's uh, not a good move. 
Um, no, queen a5 was the point. Just putting pressure on the bishop and somehow keeping equality. However, the move that uh, David played, it was mostly like a psychological uh, trick here that he used, which sometimes could be good. Here, let's say when we talk about the move by move stuff, could have gotten like a completely losing position if white played this properly. It's not like very easy to see, but what this move did, it kind of uh, ambushed the white player thinking of, oh, I have such a golden opportunity from being down like uh, two pawns to now win an exchange and sort of come back in the game. Well, in fact, what this move does, it's throwing away any chances that white has. <laughs> because we're going to see, despite winning the exchange, black is maybe even better there. Now, you can pause the video and try to find a winning uh, continuation for white. You are ambitious. Because he could have gone for bishop takes on g7. And then queen e5. Now, okay. You cannot really play king g8, yeah, because then I think f6. I mean h6, and if you play f6, then there is just uh, this deadly move. You go rook f7, rook e6 is sending you to sleep. You cannot take on c7 because of mate. That's a double check right there. Pretty unpleasant. So... You'll have to play f6 in this position, but still, it ain't good. If you play f6, then there is queen c7. If you, yeah, go rook f7, h6 is a deadly move. You cannot take the pawn because the rook will remain undefended, and after king back, queen d6 check, you've got a block, but then rook e6, this is in the air. It ain't smelling good. I'm telling you, this is going to be losing for, um, for black. Get a chance missed by white, but it uh, makes this game even more instructive, I think, because you get to see how strong the Karo Khan is when you have such a healthy pawn structure and no weaknesses, and even down an exchange, um, yeah, you can easily win. So, queen f5, hitting the rook, rook to d1, knight d5. Bishop takes on uh, d5 was uh, played soon. Because White was afraid of knight c3 type of ideas. But I mean, in this position, if you think about it, the fact that White has no open files for the rook really gives Black the initiative. So there's one open file, yeah, like this, but we can easily play b6 and close it down. There are only like semi open files, okay? These are semi open files. All of them are no open files. So the rooks can really infiltrate, which really makes them kind of pointless. And uh, the fact that there is a weak pawn, there's another weak pawn. Okay, it's important that black has a rook to work with. If in this position you take away a pair of rooks, I think that will dramatically help a white situation, even though that's still, I think, holdable. But generally speaking, when you sack the exchange, you need to have a rook. So just keep that little idea in mind. I think it's maybe one of the best uh, advices that I can give. Queen c7, queen a4 was played, hitting the d1 rook. Rook b1 and now just b6. Protecting the pawns, rook to b4 got played, uh, trying to uh, offer this little bait on a2, which was takeable, but I mean, white could get some play onto f7, so David uh, was not interested in that. Uh, by the way, if you play the passive rook a1, uh, queen a3 is very annoying, so white tried to become active, but uh, after queen d1 and then the very strong move, queen e2. Black is already completely winning. Hitting a2 plus bishop b5 is a massive threat. Winning the enemy queen. Now the game continued. Queen a7, bishop e5 check. You cannot really play g3 because the rook will remain undefended. And after king h3, queen f1. Yeah, it's just white king is getting completely owned here. Queen g2, rook g3. Black does not even rush with taking and that just forces resignation. Um, since rook has to move, wherever it goes, king g2 happens next, then you'll have to play rook g3 and you get mated. So, what did we learn from this game? Uh, do not underestimate your opponent. I'm not saying that's what happened, but uh, you saw that the 2200 from being down to pawns actually was able to find this great idea to play h4 and got a bit of uh, annoying pressure on the king side. Then, clearly... You can notice uh, the cold blood of like a 2650 player 
giving away the exchange and uh, still winning in the end game. Plus, um, yeah, I mean, besides that, in the opening, if Black would have gone for like Knight of Six, as I was saying, I, I don't think like White really gets any any fun com compensation or anything like that anymore. And I feel like genuinely Black just won a point from the opening. So, uh, okay, with that being said, I think we can move on to the following game. Okay, so for the last game of this video, I mean, by the way, if you made it till this point, I mean, congratulations, you are uh, definitely a big uh, future champ. This is going to be like a really long video, I believe close to three hours. So, all right, there's uh, one more thing we're going to look uh, onto, and uh, that is uh, the two knights. We play g6, and uh, we're actually going to see another bishop d3 game since... Apparently, uh, this is what uh, David gets to face the most. And this time he's playing against uh, Robertson Peter, 20 to 80 opponent. And he just plays for uh, Bishop to g4. Once again, we see castles and uh, then e6. So no longer uh, h3 as uh, in the previous game, but uh, castles. We see e6, which is just a... Uh, Typical move for the structure, preparing uh, either knight e7 or either knight f6, just staying very flexible. Bishop to e3 gets played by white and now knight f6 with the idea that uh, it's kind of baiting white in playing e5. This is something that we're quite happy to see because we're going to be able to undermine their center. Uh, this is not forced. They could also play the more solid h3, I would say which is going to lead to some simplifications and a pretty dull position, I would say. This is, I think, uh, pretty easy to reach for uh, everyone. And after rook e1, I really like this a5 idea. Now, if they play a4, it increases the strength of this knight f6 maneuver, trying to win the bishop pair back and then knight e5. Main point being that uh, they cannot really kick away the knight since b4 is going to be a very vulnerable square. That's kind of the trick in trying to provoke uh, a4 in all these Karo Khan structures. Now, if instead they don't play a4, they go like rook ad1, let's say. We can gain more space. They will usually play a3 and we can get our queen to a5 with um, yeah, just a solid position uh, overall. Um, just, yeah, well... In these kind of positions, we're happy with a draw, so to speak, generally. There's not really a way to, like, really play it out for a win. It's just, okay, trying to stay solid, and if they overextend, we should try to strike onto the counterattack. That's kind of the strategy and how the structure works. Um, but in the game, we do get to see a more ambitious uh, play by white, e5. Knight steps back to d7, and now e3. Whenever we get to see that, uh, we take... And now c5. Definitely with this, we can see that it's happening exactly what I mentioned. So uh, after dc5, black is able to destroy uh, white center. I mean, there's not really that much they can do. cd4 is literally going to come next. Maybe even knight c6 and then easily winning the pawn. So black is already better. Um, we see castle. d4 uh, wasn't really so good here because uh, of uh, bishop to b5 and then... White is able to get uh, a rook onto the d5 or perhaps even jump with a knight. So would have led to weird counterplay by uh, white. So no need to rush with it. Just keep it simple. So castling and then knight b5, avoiding this d4 idea. But um, black is simply better now. Queen e7, our bishop is like going to be so active on this long diagonal. We've got basically rid of white's uh, monster pawns from the center and, uh, well... We are uh, in definitely very good shape here. We saw rook c1, rook d8, just activating the pieces, and uh, before simply gives us uh, time to uh, undermine them. Now, after rook fd8, there's a bit of a threat of uh, playing d4 and then picking up the c5 pawn. So that's why uh, b4 was played by white, but then simply a5, undermining it, and after c3, knight xd3, queen d3, knight e5, black is already in the driver's seat. Knight comes to c4, rook fd1, and now queen d7 is very strong, already black is close to winning. If you play knight d4, that simply drops the a3 pawn. If you do something else like a4, let's say protecting the knight, that's failing to knight captures, followed by ab, and then the a4 pawn remains undefended. So, um, in the game, white tried knight d6, but after the simple uh, knight takes, pawn takes, queen takes, we do have an extra pawn. 
But still, got a little bit of compensation since this was a blitz game. But after A, B, Queen takes on B4. Um, definitely, Black should have an easy win after a move such as like Rook takes on D5. Even better than what happened in the game. After E, D5, White got a little bit of counterplay with Rook B1. But, uh, I mean, Black uh, sort of kept everything under control after D4. And uh, Queen to E6. We lost uh, one of the extra pawns, but there is still... One ahead, and uh, after rook d5, hitting the bishop, they step back, rook f5. Um, black is simply activating and slowly expanding. Mm -hmm. Okay, the position is definitely better. Not like the most straightforward win ever, but um, yeah, I mean, at the best, and quite rarely speaking, white will save this, but very rare, I would say. Black is uh, expanding. Okay, when you see F3, that's like a further weakening. Anyways, their position is very uncomfortable. Besides the fact that they are down a pawn, they are potentially going to get attacked on the king side. So we see bishop F6 now. King G7 just improving uh, the pieces gradually. See rook A1 check. King F2. And then uh, queen to D6. A nice little idea. Trying to infiltrate. Forcing rook to b1, but after the rook trade, uh, d3 now was pretty decent timing to advance. Idea is to play bishop to d4, which, um, yeah, white responded by bishop e3, but simply rook a5 is now a very nice uh, move. Switching to ideas of playing rook a1. Rook a2 check first, and after king g1, rook a1 is just deadly. Uh, almost winning the queen, white tried uh, bishop c1, but then d2 just... Um, Finishes the game on the spot because we're going to be winning a piece. So that was a pretty easy win from the opening. I mean, just remember, as I was saying, the setup is just like so deadly when you're able to get in this idea where you play c5, especially with their knight on c3, so they cannot defend with a pawn. And you just um, get to win that tremendous pawn on e5. And uh, black is just simply slightly better from the uh, opening. So, uh, yeah. With that being said, uh, I think we can wrap up this uh, huge video with the quick mention that, uh, well, some of you may be uh, looking for a guide on how David Howell is dealing with the fantasy variation. I wasn't actually able to find uh, too many of his games in this opening. Uh, I saw one where he played the move queen b6, which is definitely one of the trendy lines nowadays. Vincent Clymer does this quite a lot as well. But uh, I definitely advise you to check out this separate video that I have about this opening where I recommend e5, d5, queen b6, which is, uh, yeah, usually can lead to a very quick win for black after uh, this type of ideas and you can get a checkmate in seven moves. So you can check out that separate video where I'm um, yeah, making an in-depth uh, guide uh, on the theory of uh, e5 and I'm playing some um, instructive games against my subscribers. So, um, yeah. With that being said, thank you guys for making it this far into the video. Make sure to like it if you feel like you learned anything and that would really uh, boost uh, the algorithm, uh, push the video to more people and uh, thanks for that. And that's your on the channel. Take care.